At this time, if our Sergeant at Arms could start their recordings. PC recording has started. Thank you. Also, the clerk recording has started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's joint committee hearing for the New York City Council on Housing and Buildings, along with Justice System. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their cameras for verification? Once again, all panelists, please turn on your cameras for verification. To minimize disruption, we ask to please place all electronic devices on silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Chairs, we are ready to begin. Good morning, I'm Council Member Robert Carnegie, Chair of the Committee on Housing and Buildings. I wanna thank Chair Lansford of the Committee of the Justice System and other committee members for joining this hearing titled Oversight, the Potential Eviction Crisis in the Midst of COVID-19 Pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic has plunged the city into a crisis of unemployment. The impacts of pandemic have decimated several of New York City's most profitable industries, including hospitality, tourism, and the arts. As of September 5th, 2020, over a million people working in New York City have filed for unemployment insurance benefits. This does not include individuals who've lost their jobs but do not otherwise qualify for unemployment insurance, such as undocumented immigrants. Unemployment insurance in New York pays $504 per week or $26,208 per year. Although the Federal CARES Act provided 600 weekly increase over the base unemployment rate, this expired at the end of July. The New York State Department of Labor just announced a $300 weekly increase, but once this increase ends, days after Christmas, many New Yorkers will once again remain unable to pay rent. Prior to COVID-19, the city was already in the throes of an affordability and eviction crisis. An April 2019 report found that nearly half of New, York's New Yorkers were rent burdened, meaning that they paid at least 30% of their income on rent. Of those rent burdened, New Yorkers, nearly one third were severely rent burdened, meaning that they paid at least 50% of their income on rent. Displacement, eviction, and homelessness remain a true threat for many New Yorkers. From March 2019 to March 2020, there were more than 16,000 residential warrants of eviction executed in the city. In addition, as of December 2019, there were 18,700 homeless single adults and 14,792 homeless families sleeping in shelters. On March 5th, Judge Lawrence K. Marks, Chief Administrative Judge for the New York State Unified Court System suspended eviction proceedings filed on or after March 16, 2020. On March, 20, on March 20, Governor Cuomo issued a 90-day eviction moratorium. This eviction moratorium has been extended twice, first until August 20th and then until September 20th. On August 12th, Judge Marks issued a, a memorandum allowing eviction proceedings filed before March 16th to go forward. This memorandum also provided that warrants of eviction issued before March 16th may be executed after October 1st. However, earlier this month, the Centers for Disease Control issued an order under the Public Health Safety Act that suspended residential evictions through the end of 2020. That said, the CDC moratorium and the Department of Labor $300 increase both expire at the end of the year, at which point the city may face a catastrophic eviction crisis. Today, the committees will hear from the Department of Housing, Preservation and Development, the Office of Court Administration, the Department of Social Service and the Human Resource Administration's Office of Criminal Justice, who will discuss the city's attempts to stem the eviction crisis. In addition, we will hear testimony from legal service providers, advocates and other key stakeholders. I'd like to thank my colleagues from the Housing and Buildings and Justice System Committees present today. Uh, I see that we have Council Member Lansman. Who else do we have? Oh, Helen Rosenthal, always. Oh, Reverend Cabrera, the Honorable <laughs> Cabrera. Who else do I see there? Hey, Lyric, I see you. I'm not saying you yet, though. Bar and Barry Gredentrick is who I can see right now. Uh, we'll now hear from the Honorable Chair, Rory Lansman. Rob, I'm here. Oh, I see you, I'm sorry. Sorry, 
Councilmember Rivera is also here as well. So, so am I, Chair. Listen, my screen only gets like 12 people at a time. I'm sorry, unless I scroll over, I don't see you. That's an, uh, an oversight of technology, not me. Councilmember Lewis here. Hey, Farrah. I'm here too, uh, Councilman Carnegie. Hey, Alan Mizell is here as well. I'm sorry, guys. Any other council members want to uh, identify themselves while it's still uh, Chair Carnegie's fault for missing them? Yeah, thanks, Rory. Since, since the chair didn't recognize me by name, it's Councilman Mark Jonai. I did say Mark Jonai, didn't I? The Honorable Mark no. Jonai representing the upper parts of the Bronx. I just like when you say my name. I wanted to hear it again. <laughs> All righty. Good morning. I'm Council Member Rory Lansman, Chair of the Committee on the Justice System, and welcome to this joint hearing with the Committee on Housing and Buildings, co-chaired by my colleague, Council Member Robert Carnegie, on an impending flood of evictions that threatens to further harm our city in the wake of the health and economic crises brought on by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have seen efforts by government to step in with various protections, whether by the state courts, currently through a full moratorium on evictions that is set to expire at the end of this month, as well as by the governor, whose executive orders have generally offered protection for tenants facing non-payment actions, by the state legislature, where protections for tenants have been enshrined in law for the duration of the pandemic, and this month, even from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which issued a federal ban on evictions in at least some, but not all instances, set to expire on December 31st. My focus today is ensuring that the city is meeting its obligation in providing tenants fighting eviction with legal representation once eviction proceedings resume and that our courts have the systems in place to fairly and safely adjudicate cases. The coronavirus pandemic has placed intense pressure on tenants to come up with rent during extended periods of reduced or non-existent income, as well as on landlords, the courts, legal services providers, and finally <clears throat> on the city's human resources administration. In the last few years, our city has taken unprecedented steps to expand the civil right to counsel and housing court, spending hundreds of millions of dollars to ensure that tenants with a household income that falls below 200% of the federal poverty guidelines and who live in one of the growing number of zip codes, 25 citywide as of last February, have access to free legal counsel in housing court. This investment in leveling the playing field between landlords and tenants has made a difference in keeping people in their homes, even while HRA has worked to make sure landlords are made whole in non-payment cases. Just by way of example, in fiscal year 2019, the city's commitment to universal access for tenant legal services programs meant that in the universal access zip codes, 62% of tenants facing eviction, that's 41,000 households, had lawyers to defend their rights. And in 84% of those cases, the tenants were able to remain in their homes. That's thousands of families whose lives were not disrupted and traumatized by homelessness all because they had access to legal representation. For tenants facing emergencies, such as impending homelessness, eviction or dispossession, utility disconnection, fire, domestic violence, or other circumstances that affect their health and safety, the Human Resources Administration considers applications for emergency assistance known as one-shot deals. These emergency grants are a backstop against eviction for thousands of tenants in non-payment proceedings in housing court and a key piece of the puzzle in New York City when it comes to preserving families in their homes and preserving neighborhoods. The challenge of this pandemic is in its scale. Does the city have the capacity to provide emergency rental arrears funds for all of the New Yorkers who will need it? Do the legal services organizations have the capacity to provide legal representation to all of those New Yorkers who will need it? As the city's housing courts seek to continue increasing their capacity, how can we ensure that they are safe places for judges, court staff, landlords, tenants, and their attorneys to meet? The old ways of connecting tenants with attorneys at their first court appearance, for example, may need to be updated. 
So I look forward to hearing from OCA, the administration, and legal services providers about how the city plans to meet these challenges. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Lansman. Um, I'm now going to turn it over to our committee council to give some, to go over some procedural items. Thanks, Chair Cornegie. I'm Austin Branford. I'm counsel to the city council's committee on housing and buildings. Before we get started, I want to remind everyone that we'll, you will be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which point you will be unmuted. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called as I will periodically announce who the next panelist will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the Office of Court Administration. This will be followed by testimony from the administration, which will then be followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to three minutes, including responses. We will now turn to testimony from the Office of Court Administration, which is being represented by Alia Razak. I will now administer the oath. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. You can begin. Good morning, all. I am Ali Razak. I am the chief clerk of the Civil Court of the City of New York, and I am responsible for co-managing the operations of the court, including the landlord and tenant division. Chairman Lanceman, Cornegy, and council, as well as all other guests, we're pleased to share with you the efforts and steps taken by the court to ensure access to the court and meet the needs of our court users, users during this extremely challenging time. In mid-March, in consideration of the stay-at-home direction issued by the governor, the court minimized operations to the extent of processing essential matters only. For the landlord and tenant court, essential matters involve matters where a court user was locked out or denied access to their residence, required post-eviction relief, were in need of emergency rep repairs, including the lack of heat or hot water, or required access to critical services. Though working in unprecedented precedented times and it was necessary to limit services to emergencies, the court never closed. We arranged with New York City's Office of Civil Justice that they be informed of all emergency landlord and tenant applications that are filed. This procedure allowed for a legal service provider to make contact with the filing parties and in the majority of instances representation was provided to that party. In addition to making parties aware that there were legal services available to them, we converted our in-person help centers to virtual help centers, giving court users who would normally visit the court to obtain legal and procedural information, the opportunity to call in for the same service. The demand for this service was such that it was necessary to add additional court attorneys to expand the citywide service and assign coverage for each county. We addressed essential matters both virtually and in person, depending on the availability of technology for any of the impacted parties. We notified parties to actions that were considered non-essential in nature that the matter was administratively adjourned and that they would be notified when the matter was rescheduled. We accomplished notification by mailing a notice to all parties who were involved in a case that was scheduled to be heard on or after March 16th and ensure that our personnel assigned to answering telephones provided the same information. During this time, though we were not calend calendaring non-essential cases and court users were not required to answer non-payment petitions, where a person wished to file a response, we accepted and continue to accept answers by telephone, electronically, and with the assistance of the agency housing court answers. Following the guidance of various executive and administrative orders and or directives, no warrants of evictions have been processed since March 16th. Also, there have been no judgments of possession rendered other than those relating to restoring a respondent or a tenant to possession of a premises. Similar to the phased approach to reopening New York City and state, we resumed limited in-person operations and expanded our virtual operations increment incrementally over time and will continue to take an incremental approach to expanding in-person operations to reach all case types. Regarding the landlord tenant division of our court, we are remotely conferencing matters for which parties are represented, which both parties are represented. We are scheduling and hearing in-person trials. 
We discourage foot traffic at our site and instead provide information on electronic or telephonic services to court users upon first contact and via our webpage. We're providing in-person services to court users who opt to visit our facilities. Upon communicating with a court user responding to a landlord tenant proceeding, the party is as advised that there are legal services available to them and provided with the appropriate contact and telephone numbers. This includes instances where a party is answering and or filing in order to show cause. Parties seeking to enforce a pre-pandemic warrant of eviction or judgment of possession must follow the court's administrative directive issued in August. Included in this directive is the issuance of a notice to the receiving party that advises them that the landlord has applied to the court to have them evicted. They do not need to go to court in person to respond to the papers and that they can call the number associated with obtaining, obtaining a free lawyer. The reason, receiving party is further informed that if they do not get, a free, get to a free lawyer or do not want one, they can call the court to arrange a virtual appearance. appearance. Parties seeking warrants of eviction and or judgments of possession in eviction proceedings filed after March 16th remain subject to the administrative orders of the chief administrative judge. Motions for permission to act on a warrant of eviction previously issued and or for the entry of a warrant of eviction are scheduled to one calendar and virtual appearances are encouraged. We are prepared for in-person courtroom activity and courtrooms where in-person hearings are conducted have been retrofitted with plexiglass. The calendar is arranged so that matters are heard one case at a time. And where a respondent has not achieved representation, there are legal service providers present for each calendar and they are accessible to any respondent that did not achieve representation prior to the scheduled hearing. We are accepting filings both by mail and in person for landlord and tenant matters. We've implemented e-filing for our sites in New York, Kings and the Bronx and anticipate rolling out e-filing in Queens and Richmond no later than October 5th. In instances where the e-filing application has not yet been implemented, we rely on an Office of Court Administration developed electronic document delivery system to afford court, to afford court users these two submit documents further reducing foot traffic at our sites. Remote, remote appearances take place over Skype at, for business and or Microsoft Teams and any parties are informed that they can appear virtually if they have a smartphone or computer. Our clerks inform all parties with whom they communicate that they may not have to come to court in person to facilitate virtual appearances. The cl clerks collect the email addresses and telephone numbers of parties when providing service. Those persons who visit a court site are subject to temperature screening and a COVID self-assessment following guidelines established by the CDC and New York City and state departments of health. All parties entering a court building, of course, must wear masks and must observe social distancing. We've ensured that signage is posted in our buildings detailing requirements for entry, that hand sanitizer is conveniently located in public areas, and that courtrooms that host the public are retrofitted with protective equipment to ensure safety. Cleaning and sanitization have been enhanced at all of our facilities. Our operations of, of our hours of operations and occupancy limits of our facilities have been adjusted in an effort at controlling density and social distancing. Distancing staffing has been adjusted to ensure that we are able to provide services while further controlling social distancing at all of our sites. As we prepare to further address the needs of the court, we continue to assess both our undisposed caseload, the number of new filings we've received. And a snapshot of the filings from June 1st of 2019 through just September 1st of 2019, we received close to 36,000 commercial and residential filings. During the same period this year, we've received approximately 10,000 filings, which show about a 72% decrease. We're taking a careful approach to scheduling matters, considering court users who experience COVID-19 related concerns or receive un unemployment and or pandemic related as assistance and have advised us that they are unable to attend proceedings because of either circumstance. Our judges and legal support staff will continue to address matters for which both parties are represented. We are continue to, continuing our efforts at introducing and encouraging alternative dispute resolution for our unrepresented parties. We recently identified more than 100 cases in Kings where both sides are self-represented and the cases are ripe for mediation. 
These cases will be referred to the New York Peace Institute. We'll continue to encourage remote proceedings and work to enhance service to services to ensure the safety of both of our court users and the employees in accordance with guidance provided by local, state, and federal authorities. Thank you. You're welcome. We will we'll now open for questions from Chairs Carnegie and Lance Men. Chair Carnegie, do you want to kick things off? Sure, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for your testimony. Um, and thank you for your efforts, which seem to be in line with what this committee would like to see. Um, but are there action plans to reopen physical courthouses? What's the timeline for that uh, in the coming months? Our timeline is, is guided by the, the local, state, and federal authorities. There's our antip anticipations of peaks um, and in, with, with regard to the pandemic. And we're, we're, we're following the, the, the curve pretty much and the direction as it relates. Um, each step that we take is, is a slow process because our efforts are uh, to observe the new normal, which is not having courtrooms full of people waiting for their cases to be heard. We are in instances where there are um, in-person appearances. Cases are scheduled for a definite time and um, one case per, per, per particularly scheduled incremental, whether it's 15 minutes, half an hour. Um, and, and that's evident in um, the most recent part that we established is an HMP part where our jurors are hearing motions in which a party wants to execute a warrant or seeking a warrant of eviction. Those calendars are, are scheduled with parties coming in at a definite time and a definite date. So what, thank you for that. What, what, what is, I, I'm assuming that because there is a new normal that there'll be uh, a ratio of in-person and virtual hearings that take place. If that continues, what do you think that ratio realistically will look like? It's, it's challenging to, to, to paint a picture of that ratio because it's dependent on the court users uh, availability of technology. So thus far, the majority of our court users are able to attend virtually. However, there are court users that don't have the access and those, those court users in, in order to allow their case to be heard, give them the access to the court that they need, we do make arrangements for them to come in person. Um, it, it's really hard to tell because we haven't had full calendars. Um, again, our, our warrants of evictions, we have not started issuing them as yet. So um, time will tell. Um, we, we're, we're not sure what that demand will be as yet. Thank you. So in my office, we're hearing that, um, and we know that there's been a, a mail issue, right? So people getting their mail has been backed up. Um, so we anticipate from a city council perspective that there's going to be at some point uh, a flood of these cases that will come, come to bear. Uh, what's going to be the protocol for in-person hearings that gives us confidence in a social distancing uh, protocol in place for, for hearings? What's the actual protocol? Currently, the protocol is, is to, again, give a definite time and, and, and appointment for each hearing. So there is no mass 9.30 calendar call, 10.30 calendar call, 12 p.m. calendar call. The calendar call where if you're called into court for a 9.30 appearance, it's one case per, per scheduled time slot. So will you be also limiting the amount of people that can appear on a particular case? Because a lot of times we'll have people, whether it's because they need an interpreter or whether it's because they're, they're elderly and need someone to help them. Is there a protocol in place for minimizing the amount of even per person, uh, per case individuals in the courthouse? We ask the court users to, to only appear with parties that are necessary to the case. Most often with regard to resolving a case, that is the, the, the court user, the petitioner, the respondent, um, the, if there's representation, the representation. With regard to the legal services providers, the legal service providers are in the courtroom. So we, we count them as, as, as one person pretty much because they're there and they're serving any of the unrepresented respondents. With regard to trials, the uh, number of people accept, expected at trial are established in advance of the trial. Um, they're only the necessary parties are allowed in the courtroom. With regard to language services, the language services provided by the court, our interpreters are 
in the courtroom and staff with audio transmitters to maintain the distance between them and the party that they are assisting. Um, uh, I'm, I'm concerned that, especially the virtual cases, that these cases cannot meet the, the necessary meet the, the necessary protocols in place and a case could move forward simply because uh, an individual doesn't have the tools in place uh, to, to meet the hearing. I'm, I'm very concerned about that, right? So as we move to virtual and whatever that ratio is, um, I can imagine that maybe a respondent doesn't have whatever's necessary virtually. What will those cases look like? Will they be extended? Will they have another opportunity to uh, appear or will, or is there a guidance that allows that to move forward uh, irrespective of whether or not the person chose a virtual hearing and doesn't have the tools at that time to, to have the hearing proceed. In, in scheduling of a hearing, it, it is established whether a party has that access. Um, one of the tools in place is, of course, the, the universal access. The, the legal service providers are communicating with the respondents. And in most instances, the only way a, a respondent doesn't have representation thus far is because they chose not to have the representation, the legal service providers are there. Should a respondent tell us or a court user tell us that they don't have the resources, we make arrangements again for the in-person. We have instances where there are what we call hybrid appearances. And so there is one party that may be able to attend virtually and another that doesn't, which means they're in the courtroom. We have kiosks set up so that the virtual appearance and the jurist is dealing with someone in camera and dealing with someone that is on a Skype or Microsoft Teams um, presentation. So a very specific case. If I'm, a, if I'm someone who's responded that I would like to have my case heard virtually, and then the day of or the day before, I realize that I don't have the tools to do it virtually. I've agreed to it, but now my internet is down. I've agreed to it and, and my technology is not working what will be the protocol to ensure that that person gets their day in court? They bring it to the attention of the court um, in scheduling Skype conferences or Microsoft team conferences. The court uses provided with the telephone number of the court with which to communicate. Um, the adjournments of course are in the discretion of the judge, but the jurors hears that and will most likely appropriately adjourn the case until the party can either make arrangements for an in-person visit or the technology concern is resolved. I know that these questions seem very tedious, but we are moving to a, our new normal and there will be hiccups and glitches. I don't want that to negatively impact someone's ability to represent themselves and, and, not, and, and not be evicted, right? So I don't want the technology to be, you know, what we're counting on to be the, the cause uh, to, for someone being, you know, so I, I'm hoping that there'll be some leniency as we move forward uh, of, of, of in this new, new normal. I'd like for my uh, colleague and, and co-chair of this hearing, Rory Lansman, who is an actual attorney, I'm not an attorney, nor do I play one on TV, who actually has a legal background, who probably has some more solid questions uh, as it relates to that. Uh, thank you, thank you, and I'll come back on a second round, uh, but uh, I would like to defer now to my colleague, uh, Council Member Rory Lansman. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, first let me thank OCA for participating in this hearing. Uh, we really do, appreciate it and we do appreciate the partnership and, and collaboration that we have with you. Uh, let me ask you, oh, and let me also mention that um, we've been joined, I know, by council member um, Andy Cohen from the Bronx. And if there are other members who've joined and haven't been acknowledged, just raise your hand and, and we'll make sure to do that. Um, I just want to ask you about the, uh, the, the open warrants. My understanding is there's something like 14,000, 15,000 warrants of eviction that are currently pending, but that are on hold. Um, do you have a, a, an accurate number? Is that, am I, am I at least in the ballpark with that, with that number? I think with regard to that number, it depends on whoever uh, requested the data and, and the, the date, the time period for which that's covered. So I could say most likely between um, January and March of 2020, there were um, approximately 14,900 some odd warrants of eviction issued to marshals. That, and my understanding is that those folks are still entitled to a hearing, either a settlement or, or, or a status conference before those, those warrants of eviction can be, um, 
can be executed. And is my understanding, is that is that right? So yes, uh, currently the directive of the administrative judge uh, requires a motion before a warrant that was issued pre-pandemic can be issued as well as parties seeking warrants for cases for which they might have a judgment of possession have to make a motion to get permission to uh, have a warrant entered and then finally execute on that warrant. Do we know how many of those folks are represented by counsel or were represented at the time that, that the warrant of eviction was issued? No, no, we don't. We don't have that data. It, we wouldn't have that data. Um, all right, it, it, do, do you know, once those motions are made, Will those individuals who have a, a, a warrant for um, a warrant of eviction, will they be, is there a mechanism to connect those folks to legal services representatives? The motions themselves uh, include a notice to the respondent that, or the person receiving that motion, that they might not have to come to court. It provides them with the telephone number of the legal services unit that for, for which they can be assigned a legal service provider. Additionally, in the courtroom on the hearing date, the legal service providers are present in the courtroom or present virtually. How would you say uh, the cooperation has been with DCAS in getting the courts uh, ready for real live hearings in a safe manner? and? Is there anything that the council can do to uh, assist in, in, in getting some things done that, that maybe you'd like to see get done? Because you know, we, we the, the city, are the ones who actually own the courthouses and, main, and maintain them. So I, 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 I would say that, that my response to that will be two part. I, I wanna say that DCAS through their staff at, at, at all of our court sites have been extremely cooperative and stepped up with regard to the maintenance, maintenance of the building and, and, and just about anything that we've asked them to do. I think um, it, moving forward and looking at the bigger picture, we would have to question if, if the spaces that, that the courts are assigned um, that are managed by DCAS are, are sufficient to meet the needs of the court. And so it's, 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 it's more so a space issue uh, than, than uh, an assistance issue with regard to the, the work that DCAS does with and for us. All right, well, that's all that I have for the moment. I'm, I'm, I think our colleagues might have some, some questions. So uh, uh, Chair Cornegie, if you wanna handle the, you know, picking who goes next, uh, that, that's, that's, I'm good for now. I'm sorry, I think Austin has, has that. Oh, okay. Okay. So I'll, I'll now call on council members to ask questions in the order they've used the Zoom raised hand function. Council members, please keep your questions to three minutes, including responses. If there's a second round of questioning, council member questions will be limited to two minutes. A sergeant in arms will keep a timer and let you know when your time is up. So right now we just have council member Cohen. Time starts now. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, Chairs Lanceman and Carnegie and the rest of my colleagues. Uh, I, I'm very curious um, how you, I mean, is there any way to gauge what, what's, what it's going to look like in terms of volume uh, in, you know, November, December, Jan I guess, well, I guess really there won't be any evictions obviously until the end of the year, but like we, we can't have on January 1st, you know, a mad dash to the courthouse. Um, how are we going to plan for that? W what is that going to look like? So I, th I think um, there's, there's as, as with the pandemic, there, there are some, some unknowns. While there were 14,000 some odd warrants of eviction issued to the marshals, we don't know that, that, that all of those uh, warrants will be acted on. Um, I, I don't necessarily have the numbers. I feel like there was a, maybe about 2,600 warrants of eviction that were issued and the parties were served. So that takes the number down a bit and that doesn't mean that we won't have to serve the needs of the 14,000 parties involved in those cases, but it, it seems like it will, it will be something paced. That, a, a, that the party seeking to execute on a warrant uh, has to make a motion. 
that, that it's still in the, the discretion of the, the jurist that is hearing that case, whether that warrant's gonna be executed or not. Um, we are, are making steps to prepare. Um, we have court users anecdotally who call. There's some people that are no longer in those apartments. There's some people that have left the city. So there's so much unknown that we don't have um, to, to apply a, a, a viable response, I would say. Uh, I, I understand and, and I am incredibly sympathetic in terms of the dilemma and the challenges faced. Um, but on the flip side, like I, I think maybe we need to be planning and planning in the alternative um, for, you know, and I'm not sure that there will be, you know, on January 1st, landlords will be racing to the courthouse to commence, uh, you know, tens of thousands of non-payments, but it's also not out of the realm of possibility. Um, and uh, I'm very, you know, obviously, I think I and my colleagues are very concerned about like sort of that there's a, a, a backlog of a problem that hasn't quite, you know, manifest yet. Uh, and that we need to be prepared to deal with it in a humane so, way. Exactly. I, I agree. I, I would say that, again, looking at the snapshot of, of case filings from last year to this year for that particular period, June 1st to September 1st, um, we're at a 72% decrease. We continue to view our case filings. We're monitoring case filings um, that are coming in in the various ways. And time um, expired. We'll adjust accordingly. Um, we have also um, brought our staff back to operations incrementally and continue to increase staffing, of course, observing uh, density in the building and, and social distancing so that we can address the filings as they're coming in. And we'll continue to prepare to, to, um, for what could be the worst um, and, and hope that that doesn't uh, occur. Okay. All right, thank, thank you. If there is a second round, I have, I have a question or two more. Definitely a second round. Thank Next you, Chair. Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you. Just um, thank you and apologies for the lack of screen. I just want to follow up on Councilmember Cohen's questions. Um, is there a way to keep record of the people who do not answer the door? Or, you know, in some way where you just said, Perhaps they've left town, but they're not getting the notice. Is there some way to track that? I'm not sure I under, understand the question, but I, I, we, that is not something that we track at this time. Um, the, when, when an action is filed, the, the filing party is required to ensure that service is made. Um, that is, that, that's the responsibility of the filing party. In housing court actions, there is a second notice, which is a postcard that is mailed to uh, the, the respondent. And um, we do keep maintain postcards that are returned as undeliverable, postcards that are returned as party no longer at this address. So we do have that mechanism in place. Um, and right. the- and you've answered, and then uh, we'll come back to that in one second real quickly. What languages are in the letters that are sent from the courthouse or in the postcards? Um, I can't call them all out to you at this. There's, there, there are at least six to nine languages. There's oh, okay. Spanish, there's, there's Russian, there's French, there's Urdu. Oh, there you is... answered my question. But okay. That's good. So so a range, it's sent out with a range of languages. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, it is. Um, and then I guess the last question, just to go back to it, would be what you do with the postcards that are returned. So, um, And sort of bigger picture policy-wise, sort of what to make of that. So the, the postcards are, are stored with the court file. Generally, the second step, should a respondent not respond to the court in a non-payment case, file an answer, 
or um, in a holdover case not appear, the, the petitioner might seek a default judgment against that party. And in reviewing a case for a, whether a default judgment should be rendered, it's brought to the court's attention that the postcard was returned as undeliverable. Thank you. So we're still, we'll circle back to our chairs before starting a second round of questions. So if Chairs Corner or Lance may have additional questions. Uh, yes, so I, I'd like to start, listen, when we decided as a council that we were going to, you know, uh, lead this state in uh, doing our hearings um, virtually, there was a great deal of behind the scenes uh, things that had to happen for us to be able to do this uh, with cybersecurity implications and all kinds of different things. So uh, big shout out to the speaker and to the staff for being able to put these together, but it was, it was no easy feat to be able to do that and have the same confidentiality and have cybersecurity. Um, have you considered the cybersecurity implications of holding hearings online? And if so, can you share the steps taken to ensure proper cybersecurity will be in place for these hearings? I would say that 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 the, I, I'm only able to give a short answer to that. We have the Office of Court Administration has an entire unit um, dedicated to technology. That's our division of technology. And I would say that our division of technology carefully reviews uh, the, the options with regard to uh, virtual hearings and uh, ensure that our cyber safety is, is, is covered. Um, I would not be able to give details regarding that. Okay. Um, so I have two other questions. One is uh, something I would hope that I never have to ask and I never have to use this phrase again which is priority evictions. So with the backlog of evictions, uh, what's, the, what's gonna be the protocol or the methodology in place to determine which of those go to the forefront? There's gonna be a huge backlog. There's no way around that. I mean, there's no sense in us trying to, to, to sugarcoat that. How will you determine who's first when it, as, it, as it comes to these eviction hearings? Um, we, we, we don't make a determination or prioritize uh, warrants of eviction or requests for warrants of eviction in any other manner than those that are received and clocked in are processed, they're, they're processed in the order that they come in. Um, the, the, the added measure would be that they come in with the, a copy of the order granting them permission to request a warrant of eviction. So even, even those that are on backlog from March will still have that same protocol. There'll be no other protocol established as it relates to who, which, which, which of these hearings are brought first. Right. Thus far, the, the, we are following the directive of the administrative judge. And in order to act on a warrant of eviction that was issued prior to the pandemic or to request a warrant of eviction for a matter that a judgment was rendered prior to the pandemic, you must file a motion requesting that the action that you, you are seeking is ordered by a judge. And in that motion, you're serving the respondent with a notice. In addition that you're going to seek a warrant of eviction, the notice is telling them that they may not have to come to court that they are entitled to legal services and there is a number for them to call and that they might not have, again, might not have to attend the hearing um, in person. So I'm gonna apologize in advance. It's not my intent to throw you off, but I'm getting a flood of, uh, of, of questions around while we've spent a great deal of time in this uh, hearing is centered around evictions about foreclosures. Um, is there a different protocol in place for foreclosures? Um, the most I could say regarding foreclosures, because foreclosures are, are handled by the Supreme Court, and I am not representing the Supreme Court, is that there have been um, stays, um, both by the governor and I believe by the chief administrative judge, but I'm not unable to speak to, to the process, and I apologize for that. No problem. Um, Thank you so much for even addressing that. It was no, I had no reasonable expectation that you would, based on it being not yours. So thank, thank you for even responding uh, to that. That's all I have in uh, this round. I'll turn it over to my co-chair, uh, the Honorable Rory Lansing. Thank you very much. Um, have you seen an increase in eject, ejectment 
proceedings in Supreme Court, which is an alternative route for landlords seeking to, to kick a, a tenant out? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not privileged at this time. I can probably get it, but to Supreme Court data, uh, with regard to ejectments in the lower court, I can't say that we've seen an increase. Okay. Sorry, uh, okay, that's I'm, all I'm, I have, thank you. I, I, do, I do have another question. So um, there's been a lot of talk, well, there's actually been no talk about um, uh, eviction prevention per se. Has the city conducted any outreach to New Yorkers who are at high risk of being evicted? With regard to the court's perspective, that is not necessarily an outreach we do. Our communication or connection with, with a person facing eviction most often comes when there's a matter filed against them. Got it. So, so, so that doesn't take place in your courtroom. Thank you again for addressing uh, giving me some latitude and addressing something that doesn't necessarily fall under your, your, your purview. But as you can, as you can understand, um, with the backlog uh, and with what's going forward and with the moratoriums in, in, in jeopardy of being lifted, um, there is grave concern around the city for what we will see if we're not more proactive and if we don't provide an, an environment for preventive prevention to evictions and also foreclosures but also if we don't have a system that's prepared to deal with the onslaught. Uh, and, and I use those words not to be dramatic, but I can only imagine what we were facing prior to this, this pandemic and what we'll be seeing with the backlog. So thank you again. Understood. I, I just also like to, to mention, since you mentioned foreclosure, anecdotally, um, some of the users we serve are those small property owners who, who, who have, have, might have even prevailed prior to the pandemic with a judgment against a, a, a respondent, a tenant, and um, who, um, due to the lack of resources, mentioned that they, that they could be facing foreclosure based on the activity or inactivity of the housing court matter. So there's a slight connection. Um, I don't know if that's something that, that, that you are interested in. A hundred percent. That's grave. That's of grave concern. A lot of the units that are affordable units uh, reside directly in these smaller units, and they're in jeopardy because of the ability to have this moratorium in place. Um, now we find homeowners, conversely, who are who are you know in jeopardy simultaneously while there's an eviction proceeding going on. There's a, a subsequent potential for a foreclosure based on non-payment of rent. So we are, as a city, uh, in a very precarious position. We want to protect and undergird and be able to build home ownership. Uh, but in this pandemic, it's causing problems not only for, for tenants, residential tenants, but also for uh, homeowners of these smaller properties who rely solely, in some instances, on the ability to meet their mortgage based on their rents being paid. So, so I'm hearing from both ends. I'm hearing from these small homeowners, two, three, four unit homeowners who find themselves in jeopardy of keeping their properties and maintaining their properties based on the inability for their tenants to pay rent. So while they have sympathy, they find themselves in court almost simultaneously trying to hold on to those properties. So we, we, have, a, we have a real serious issue that we have to deal with on both ends. So thank you for addressing it and even, and even uh, bringing it up. You're welcome. So I know if my colleague Mark Jonai where he, he, would, he would say the same thing because in his district, there are a lot of homeowners who are two, three, four family homeowners who will certainly are flooding his office as well as mine and some other offices of council members around the district of what are we doing to help ensure while we're protecting uh, uh, tenants from eviction and staving off eviction and making sure, what are we doing to make sure that those small homeowners who are the backbone uh, of, of, of this city, how, how are we protecting them uh, in, in the court system as well. So thank you. Yeah. That, that's all I have in terms of questions. Great. Yeah, anybody else? Additional questions from chairs. We'll still go back to council member Cohen as the second round of questions will be limited to two minutes. Time starts now. Okay, thank you again. You know, again, we're all obviously concerned about sort of a, a you know, a, a wave of uh, eviction actions uh, commenced in 2021. Um, and I realize this is not exactly a sound policy, 
Uh, but do you think that your like your capacity uh, to process these cases is going to be sort of a limiting factor in 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 the crisis you know, unfolding at, at a pace that maybe the city can manage? Like uh, like in, in the end of the day, how many cases? How long does it take from if it you know in early 2021 I commence a non-payment uh, or or non-payment is commenced against me? How long will it take? Uh, do you think for an order of eviction to issue? Um, that, 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 that's really hard to speak to, Councilman. Um, it's, it's really hard to speak to. Um, it, it, each case is, is, though the circumstances may be similar, uh, is individual. And, um, there, there are steps with regard to, um, the parties involved in the case with regard to filing an answer. Um, right now we are, we are receiving answers. Um, but we're not yet scheduling them. Um, parties are, are informed that uh, a, uh, we've received your answer. However, um, due to the pandemic, we are, we're not yet scheduling them. So it's really difficult. In, can, I, can I ask, in, in pre-pandemic days, uh, from the date of commencement uh, to in cases where an order of eviction issued, how long, how long on average does that take? Um, it, 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 it could be resolved in one court appearance. It could take three to five court appearances. It's, it's really challenging to, to, to pinpoint a, a, an average time period. But even, even appearances, I mean, you could get an adjourned date in three weeks, you could get an adjourned date in three months. Um, I mean, I would imagine OCA does have some data on how long it takes. To time expired. I, I would say that we can probably um, get hands on the data. I didn't come prepared with that today, and I apologize for that. I, I also, I, I am, as Chair Landsman said, we really appreciate uh, your participation here, uh, and it's it's very helpful. So I just want to say make make it clear that I'm very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. With no further questions from chairs or council members, um, we will now turn to testimony from the administration, which will be followed by testimony from members of the public. Today, we'll hear from Jordan Dressler from the Human Resources Administration, Sarah Mallory and Lucy Jaffe from the Department of Housing Preservation and Development, and Aaron Drinkwater from the Department of Social Services will also be available for Q&A. I will now administer the oath. Please raise your right hands. I will call on each of you individually to affirm. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee, and to respond honestly to council member questions? Start with Jordan. Yes. Sarah? Yes. Lucy? Yes. And Aaron? Yes. Great. You may begin when ready. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon, Chairs Cornegie and Lanceman and uh, other members of these committees. Uh, thank you for inviting me today to appear before your committees today to discuss the work of the Office of Civil Justice of the Human Resources Administration. My name is Jordan Dressler. I'm the Civil Justice Coordinator. And in that capacity, I'm proud to oversee the Office of Civil Justice. I'm joined today by uh, Sarah Mallory, Executive Director for Government Affairs at the Department of uh, Housing Preservation and Development, as well as Lucy Jaffe from uh, HPD and Aaron Drinkwater from the Department of Social Services. You know, as you know, OCJ is part of New York City's HRA DSS, the nation's largest social services agency, assisting more than 3 million New Yorkers annually through the administration of a range of public assistance programs. With the enactment of Local Law 61 in 2015, OCJ was established as a permanent office within the Human Resources Administration, tasked with establishing, managing, overseeing, and monitoring the city's civil legal services programs. This year, we are working with over 70 nonprofit legal services organizations and partners across the five boroughs to provide access to legal assistance to thousands of New Yorkers in need, critical services that provide low income and other vulnerable residents, the ability to access and preserve basic necessities of life, such as stable and affordable housing, legal immigration status, a fair and safe workplace, and access to government benefits. New York City recently marked the third anniversary of the enactment of Local Law 136 of 2017 the city's landmark right to counsel law, and the formal launch of OCJ's universal access initiative implementing the right to counsel law. Since that time, OCJ has partnered with RTC UA legal providers from across New York City, as well as court administrators, judges, and non-judicial staff to greatly increase the availability of high quality legal assistance. 
hundreds of thousands of tenants facing eviction proceedings in New York City Housing Court have benefited from free legal representation and advice through OCJ's programs. And the citywide rate of tenants facing their eviction cases with legal representation in court, which stood at 1% in 2013, reached 38% in 2019. At the same time, the number of evictions conducted in New York City has dropped to historic lows, falling by 41% between 2013 and 2019, while evictions nationwide are up. We're very proud of these milestones and achievements, but we recognize that they are from a different time before COVID-19. All of our clients, our neighbors, and our colleagues have been touched in some way by this crisis. And the aftershocks in New York City Housing Court will continue to be felt for some time to come. Today, I'd like to share with you how OCJ and its nonprofit legal service provider partners are working to ensure that New York City tenants who are facing eviction have effective access to free legal assistance during the COVID-19 emergency. As you are aware, the pandemic has substantially altered operations in the New York City Housing Court, and both substantive and procedural law have been transformed through the enactment and implementation of a series of moratoria, administrative orders, and legal mandates. As the pandemic began, OCJ was well positioned to move quickly and effectively to address the emerging circumstances impacting the legal needs of tenants. Our central role in the contracting and administration of city funded civil legal services programs has enabled OCJ to coordinate among and between legal services providers, the courts and other city offices efficiently and effectively, ensuring that legal providers and their clients have had access to reliable information about legal developments and court and agency operations. Moreover, we work closely with our agency partners, including the Mayor's Office to Protect Tenants and HPD, to ensure that reliable information about tenant rights and protections is widely available, including the recent launch of the city's tenant resource portal, an online portal that features comprehensive and up-to-date information about free public and private resources that can help New York City tenants prevent their eviction and remain stably housed through this crisis. Additionally, OCJ's legal organization partners have participated in hundreds of education and outreach activities to increase awareness of tenant protections and the availability of free legal services since the start of the pandemic, including virtual town halls, know your rights sessions, tenant associations meetings, continuing legal education trainings for other attorneys and radio appearances. And each week, DSS Commissioner Banks shares pertinent information and takes questions about all HRA programs and client needs including legal services and housing court updates on a weekly call for elected officials, CBO partners and advocates. Each week following the call, an informational email is sent to nearly 5,000 recipients. As the emergency has unfolded, OCJ and its partners rapidly recast the legal services we provide to meet the immediate and urgent needs experienced by tenants in the city and to make services widely available consistent with health and safety considerations. With courthouses and law offices transitioning to primarily remote and telework operations, OCJ's legal services partners have successfully continued to provide legal intake, advice, research, and advocacy and representation services remotely by phone, video conference, and electronic filing. And we have updated our contracts to reflect this new normal of doing business. Working in collaboration with OCJ's legal services partners, Housing Court Answers, and the Mayor's Office, we established a housing legal hotline to provide access to live phone-based legal advice and assistance provided by our legal services partners. Through this hotline, tenants with questions and concerns about eviction and housing court, as well as other landlord tenant issues are receiving legal advice and assistance Monday through Friday, nine to five. Access to the phone-based legal assistance is currently available via 311 and the mayor's public engagement unit through the city's tenant helpline and through Housing Court Answers, which is supported in part by discretionary funding provided by the City Council and administered by OCJ. Legal advice services are free and are available to all New York City residential renters with housing questions or issues, regardless of income, geography or zip code, or immigration status. In addition, as you've heard, OCJ worked with the Housing Court to establish a case referral protocol to connect all unrepresented tenants who file emergency cases in court with free access to free legal representation provided by an RTC UA provider. Today, any unrepresented tenant who has filed an action to be restored to possession to their apartment after an illegal lockout, who has filed an HP action for emergency repairs, can be referred to OCJ by the court for free legal representation by one of our contracted legal providers. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
More recently, Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks issued court guidance allowing landlords to ask the housing court to permit pre-pandemic eviction warrants to move forward. In response, OCJ is working with the court to ensure that no tenant faces the threat of eviction without access to free legal representation. The court is required, as you've heard, the court is requiring landlords motion papers to include information about how to access free legal assistance. And OCJ is referring unrepresented tenants facing the enforcement of a pre-pandemic eviction warrant who reach out for free legal representation to one of our providers. In addition to this pre-conference protocol, OCJ stands ready to provide free legal representation for unrepresented tenants who respond to motions to proceed with pre-pandemic eviction warrants by appearing virtually or otherwise for a scheduled court appearance. And we are working with court administrators and providers to assign counsel to any tenant at such a conference who wants legal representation in their case. This initiative is citywide and it is universal. All tenants who are currently facing eviction warrants are eligible, regardless of zip code, immigration status, or whether the tenant may have previously declined or been found ineligible for legal representation under the Universal Access Program, and regardless of household income with an income waiver by OCJ. Complementary to these efforts, OCJ identified approximately 14,000 households without representation that had outstanding eviction warrants issued by the housing court in 2020 that were not executed by city marshals pre-pandemic. We reached out by mail informing those households of the availability of free legal assistance through OCJ. And we're now working with legal providers in the public engagement unit to conduct more targeted outreach to tenants facing warrant related motions that are pending in court. As we move forward and face unprecedented and likely unexpected challenges, the Office of Civil Justice is committed to continuing to work hand in hand with all justice system stakeholders to make civil legal assistance available and effective for clients. Now more than ever, New Yorkers need a justice system that is fair and accessible. And we are grateful to the city council for your support in helping us achieve that goal. Thank you and I'd be happy to take your questions. Thank you. So before we actually move forward to chair questions, we're gonna actually redo the oath very quickly. There were some audio okay. issues. Um, okay. So we'll call the four of you again, if you can answer a little bit louder and we'll space you out so we can catch it. So please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I'll start with Jordan Dressler. Yes. Sarah Mallory. I do. Lucy Joffe. Yes, I do. And Aaron Drinkwater. Yes. Great, thank you. We'll now move to chair questions. Chair Cornegie, do you wanna start things off? Yes, thank you so much uh, for your testimony. Um, I, there's so much, I don't even know where, where to start, um, but I can, I can ask, how, how does the agency plan to accommodate a potential wave of applicants when eviction moratoriums end? I, th I think there are two parts to that question. I, I, I think perhaps by applicants, um, the, the chair means uh, applicants for rental assistance, but first let me speak to um, uh, legal services, uh, uh, obviously the purview of the Office of Civil Justice. Um, we have been working hand in hand with our legal providers and with the court to meet the needs as they have developed. Um, uh, uh, Council Member Cohen uh, said something about a limiting factor uh, earlier in terms of uh, the operations of the court. And, um, uh, you know, we will obviously be seeing how things develop, but we believe that's true. For now, uh, the court's operations have been limited and therefore the threat of eviction, even you know, irrespective of, of the moratoria, the threat of eviction uh, is therefore limited. Um, we are making sure that we are implementing programs and working with our partners to have legal services available for those who actually uh, are under threat of eviction or threat of displacement. Um, so when the court was remaining open for those essential cases in which a tenant had been uh, legally locked out, we put uh, procedures in place to provide uh, legal representation for all such tenants. Now that the court is moving forward with uh, motions to enforce pre-pandemic warrants of eviction, we have put procedures in place both prior to the court appearance and in the court appearance to make sure that legal representation is available to those who want it. That's just starting now. We're gonna see how it unfolds, but we think it will shine a light towards how moving forward within the, what and called the backlog, the, the, the additional caseload of pre-pandemic cases that the court will be moving on to will show us how best to do that. Um, but we are committed to uh, ensuring that uh, uh, legal assistance is available 
uh, to tenants facing eviction uh, now more than ever in the midst of this pandemic. So um, I, I want to be the first to say uh, thank you for the work that you do. Um, I was on the budget negotiation team and we faced one of the toughest budgets, obviously, that this, in the history of the city. And we fought hard, uh, myself and my colleagues, to make sure that the resources were still available to undergird uh, our legal service system, um, anticipating uh, the onslaught that's coming. So, um, but how, how has the implementation of the right to counsel uh, being modified in response to the COVID-19 crisis? Thank you for the question. It's um, obviously we have, as the court has transformed and as the landscape has transformed, uh, we have transformed and our providers have transformed in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the approach that we're taking. Uh, whereas before, um, intake was oriented around uh, cases newly filed and therefore fee you're seeing their first appearance in court shortly after that. And uh, we were taking a zip by zip approach uh, to meet the needs in high need neighborhoods, as well as to orient the court and other court stakeholders to the idea of universal access and universal uh, representation uh, bit by bit and phase by phase. Uh, we have now pivoted to an approach where we are meeting the needs that are most urgent. So if there is a tenant who is facing a pre-pandemic warrant of eviction that could be executed sometime after October 1st, barring an intervention, we want to make sure that legal services are there and that representation is available. Uh, we have, as I said, issued an income waiver uh, to ensure that uh, even those who may have income uh, modestly above 200% of poverty uh, will have access to free legal representation if they're facing such a warrant in the midst of this crisis. And so uh, it has required some adjustment. It's required certainly a lot of adjustment and collaboration with our legal services providers for which we are extremely grateful. And we are really inspired by their efforts to uh, step up and step in and uh, provide that protection to tenants in need. Um, as we move forward and we do so hand in hand with the court and providers, uh, we think that these will serve as models for how we how we do that. So, so let me just be clear, if you live in a zip code where right to counsel has not been implemented, but you find yourself in housing court due to an issue that's COVID related, are you guaranteed free counsel? If you are facing a pre-pandemic warrant of eviction, which is the only case, the only, and the landlord has duly filed a motion to bring that case back to court for a decision by the judge and whether or not that eviction can proceed and the marshal can proceed, uh, you have access to free legal representation, regardless of your zip code. The other cases that the court is currently hearing already involve cases in which counsel has been uh, retained by uh, the tenant. When I say retained, I mean, I mean that the tenant is represented by counsel. Uh, there are thousands of such cases, and for the last several months, the court has been hearing those cases by way of virtual conferences. Uh, the reason there are thousands of those cases is because we've done a good job of increasing the rate of representation in housing court for the last several years. Uh, it was as high as 38 uh, percent when uh, at the end of calendar year 2019. Uh, those cases were uh, immediately frozen uh, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, and the housing court began to hear those two attorney conferences that I think you heard Mr. Zach say uh, over the last several months. The, the work on those cases continues. Now that there is a new component of the work happening in housing court that could involve unrepresented tenants, uh, we moved quickly uh, along with our partners, some of whom you'll hear from later today, uh, to have procedures in place to ensure that those unrepresented tenants would have access to legal representation. Again, regardless of zip code. Uh, thank you so much. I have more questions, but I'll do them on a second round. I defer now to uh, the Honorable Rory Lastman, my co-chair. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, you referenced in your uh, testimony, um, we've updated our contracts to reflect this new normal of doing business. Could you talk about that, how those contracts have been updated? Sure. I mean, uh, the, the, the contracts were wit written at a time when uh, physical contact or, or you know, physical presence with a, a client was simply assumed. Um, and issues around signatures and retrieving documents uh, were not obstacles. And we quickly realized we had to update those contracts. 
um, to reflect uh, the new normal of working remotely and connecting with uh, clients and potential clients electronically. Um, on a separate track, we are working closely with our providers to assess COVID related costs that they might be incurring. Uh, that's a process that is uh, being uh, sort of centrally handled by the Office of Management and Budget. Um, but uh, we are in touch with all providers about what those needs might look like, be they related to technology, training, uh, and, and other reforms to practice that are just necessary in light of uh, the pandemic and health and safety regulations. All right, well, we're gonna hear from the legal services providers uh, later and the way these things are structured is by then you won't be in the, in the witness uh, seat. I hope you do stick around, um, but I won't be able to come back to you. So uh, is, is there anything that, that I can anticipate the, the providers saying in terms of their uh, concerns or satisfaction with the process that that I can address with you now? I, I, I would expect that they would be satisfied with the process as we've been moving forward in it. I, I or a member of my team will be listening and will be listening to see if that's not the case. Okay, I appreciate that. Um, you know, when, we, when you testified earlier, I think it was earlier this year, uh, we talked about the expansion of universal access according to, to the law. Obviously, the pandemic has upended everything, but um, is that still, or is that going to be on track? How do you uh, anticipate this uh, enormous uh, pause in, in, in the legal process impacting the, the continued rollout of universal access? I, you know, I, it, so, let, let me answer it this way. Um, from a uh, <clears throat> from an administration support perspective, and from the perspective of uh, looking to move forward, uh, we are on track. Um, as Chair Carnegie said, um, we are uh, pleased um, about the state of the budget um, now more than ever, um, knowing all the challenges that uh, the city and, and and all of us are facing. Um, but uh, we are well resourced for this year, and we are. Uh, resource for full implementation in the coming fiscal year. Um, much of the implementation will turn on uh, the ability of our providers to um, hire up, meet that capacity. Um, there are unique challenges to some of that now, which I'm sure some of the providers can speak to. Um, some may be relating to the bar exam. Uh, some may be relating to uh, just challenges with onboarding staff. Um, we've been in touch with our providers and we know that, you know, it calls for creativity and innovation in terms of uh, service delivery and, and, and staffing models and those dialogues continue, but uh, we are committed to meeting the needs as they emerge. Um, certainly with respect to the work that is happening right now and is just starting to begin. Uh, in terms of uh, the court's work involving uh, uh, pre-pandemic warrants of eviction, where New York City tenants may be at uh, a more immediate threat of eviction in the absence of intervention after the moratoria are lifted. Uh, we thought it was appropriate to implement a full representation model and ensure that whether someone is reaching out prior to that court date or is appearing virtually or otherwise on that court date, the legal services were there and re legal representation was available. And so that's what we've done. Uh, it's begun uh, in the Bronx and Staten Island just this week. So uh, there is there's no data to point to, but uh, we, are, we are pleased with the run up to that, uh, the launch of that process. And uh, you know, so much will turn on the ability of the court, uh, the capacity of the court, um, and we expect to be in dialogue every step of the way. Uh, are you seeing, I'm going to ask the legal services providers this, of course, but, but are you seeing an increase in ejectment proceedings in Supreme Court? And I know that it had been, I believe it had been the practice that legal services providers could, could apply or ask for um, permission under, under UA to, to, to do those proceedings as well. We, we have not, um, and we 
uh, have been in touch with providers and advocates about uh, whether this uh, sort of opting for an ejectment action uh, was was happening in earnest. Um, the feedback we've gotten is that it wasn't, and we put our providers on notice that uh, should they learn of any ejectment action in the midst of this crisis, they should let us know immediately so we could talk about what appropriate support looks like. Um, we It is on our radar. Um, it does not seem to have manifested. Um, it, but we are keeping an eye on it and we'll certainly be looking to address it if it becomes an alternative route for legal displacement. Um, we're certainly open to feedback if, if folks are hearing otherwise, but um, it's something that we are sensitive to and uh, it's something that we'll be keeping an eye on. All right, um, Rob, that's all I have for now. So I don't, I don't know if we have uh, any other of the members who have questions. We do. You go those, we can go those first and return to chairs if you have any more. Um, I'll, I'll now call on council members to ask questions in the order they've used the Zoom raise hand function. As a reminder, keep this first round of questions to three minutes, including responses, and the second round will be two minutes. Uh, we had council member Cohen. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much for your testimony. Um, you mentioned at the end of the your, your last answer uh, court capacity and you know a lot of people you know advocates uh, are concerned about you know lo or looking for a sort of macro policy uh, to help tenants that I you know I'm not sure what the answer is uh, but it, it, if court capacity it can't I mean I don't know what court capacity is going to be going forward uh, but that could obviously be an incredibly limiting factor uh, in the you know in people facing eviction, if the court can't process the the non-payment action, uh, even you know even if you know where there's no defense, um, do you have a sense of what the court what, what you think capacity is going to be like going forward, and uh, if you think that that's going to sort of um, nurse out uh, the problem in a way that we could maybe that that might be manageable? Yeah, I, I, it, it's very hard to say, and um, <clears throat> I, I certainly, you know, I, I would defer to the Office of Court Administration on any of those assessments, and, and we've heard what, what they had to say. What, one other sort of variable that I would um, inject into this, which I think will be key, and certainly legal providers can speak to this in greater detail, is uh, sort of the, the, the complexion of the litigation that actually is happening, um, even before uh, the pandemic, if we can remember a time. Uh, uh, housing court was in the process of transformation. First with the introduction of a tremendous number of creative and inventive and dedicated uh, legal services attorneys defending tenants and really making the law through the introduction of new legal arguments, making motions, resulting in decisions. Um, on top of that, we had the introduction of the new rent laws uh, in the spring of last year, which opened up uh, new grounds in many cases for uh, either mitigation or outright elimination of the threat of eviction. Um, now we have new issues that are at play. Um, and uh, I think it still remains to be seen what cases will actually look like uh, in court and of course, the, the, the needs uh, to litigate, the needs to have hearings if that's, ne if that's necessary are going to inform the pace of the court in moving cases along. Um, I think what, what, I'll, what I will say is that uh, we have extraordinary dialogue with the court and extraordinary dialogue with our providers. Um, we're very happy to be the Office of Civil Justice this time and be sort of a central coordinating point on this. Well, let me just ask you this then. I mean, it, do you, what do you think that the landscape in terms of uh, um, expired. eviction actions is going to look like in, in the middle of next year, in the middle of 2021? Uh, is, is the courthouse going to be just flooded with, with cases? Do you, do you think that that's not going to happen you, based on, on the state of the law and, and the evolving uh, landscape? I, I, again, if we're trying to Pre, you know, proactively uh, form a response to this problem. I'd like to know what you know people, experts think that the problem is going to look like. 
I, I appreciate the question. Unfortunately, I'm not sure I have a satisfying answer. It is just, there are many, many variables here and they seem to change uh, often. And, and of course, the largest variable in all of this, which uh, I am by no means an expert in, uh, are the health and safety dynamics out there. And so much will turn on that. So I, I think, I think that, that's, that's unfortunately the most satisfying answer I can provide. Uh, I appreciate that. Thank you, Chairs. Next up for questions is Council Member Gradenchik. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Carnegie, um, my chair and uh, Chair Lanceman. I don't often have the, the pleasure of sharing time with uh, Chair Lanceman, but um, I do today. My, my question maybe is a little, um, you know, uh, you know, putting the cart before the horse. I don't know what the right analogy is or the, the, the my, my question is how, how do we prevent people or how are we preventing people currently from even getting into the legal system now? I know that um, in the past, and, and maybe this is really a question for a general welfare committee hearing um, combined with housing and buildings, but um, what are we doing to keep people from getting there? I know that in, in, in today and, and in times past, um, people could be helped with a one-shot assistance, and um, I wonder if somebody could talk about that. Um, my my great fear, uh, having sat on general welfare and housing and buildings uh, for almost five my my time in the council, um, and it's I think the great fear that's shared by everybody here is is a massive wave of evictions, and um, we just don't have um, the capacity to deal with that. And I think it would be a, um, a, a disaster of, of the human proportions that the city hasn't seen in, in decades. And, and none of us um, since the Great Depression have had to deal with that. Um, we know that the numbers of homeless uh, families seeking shelter are down um, somewhat. Um, but my real question is, how are we preventing people from even getting to court in the first place? And I'll take that answer, Mr. Dressler, if you'd like to try. Uh, I was going to defer to my colleague, uh, Aaron Drinkwater, who I think can speak. Ms. Drinkwater, I'd be happy to hear from you too. Good afternoon, council member. Thank you for the question. Um, so in addition to the legal services that my colleague, Mr. Dressler was speaking to, um, you're absolutely correct in that uh, individuals can still apply for one-shot deals to pay rent and utility assistance uh, arrears that they might have, um, as well as apply for uh, rental assistance uh, that they might need. So those programs continue to be available. Um, while we know that um, evictions are not moving forward, um, in large part, uh, clients can still come to us through our home-based providers. Um, the 26 locations across the city, uh, they're virtually operating uh, in this environment and clients can work with them to receive assistance to avoid entry into shelter. Are we seeing an uptick? And I would, I, I you know, my, I have to think that there's been an, uh, an increase in the number of people seeking that assistance, given the economic realities we're facing. Um, I don't have the, I don't have the latest data, um, but what we do know is that we continue to share the information about uh, the I'm expired. Uh, and the availability of those services, encouraging uh, New Yorkers who are in need of assistance to apply, so we can ensure that uh, the best resource can be made available to them. Yeah, I mean, it's a lot, it's a lot cheaper and it's a lot better uh, for everybody involved um, that we prevent evictions. Um, and if we have to pay the rent, that's fine. It's a lot cheaper in the long run uh, for the taxpayers and it's a lot better for the families, obviously. Uh, that's gotta be our first concern um, if we can stave that off and uh, put them on a proper footing. So I'm sure we're gonna be talking about this a lot more in um, coming months and in coming hearings. But I thank you, uh, thank you for uh, answering that question, both of you, and I thank the chair for your indulgence. Thank you. Thank you. Next up for questions is Councilmember Rosenthal. Time starts now. Thank you. Um, appreciate all the hard work that you're doing. In fact, my questions I hope reflect uh, how much I appreciate the work that all three of you are doing, um, the work of your offices. Um, I. I'm worried about two things. One, people slipping through the cracks for whatever reason and just not getting an access to a lawyer. 
And second, I'm worried about people who have gotten a, a one shot but need another one shot. And I guess third, I'm worried about whether or not we're paying our nonprofits enough money to hire lawyers and to be able to function um, as well. So those are basically my three questions. The first one, um, I'm wondering if there's one more step that could be um, and put into the process, which is could a letter go, or maybe this already happens, but a letter go from HRA, from the Office of um, Civil and Legal um, to tenants prior to a sheriff going out to actually physically evict someone? Um, thank you, Council Member, for the both the question and for the continuing support for the work that we're doing, it, it is appreciated. Um, we are uh, taking a fresh look at outreach. First, I should, I should point out that uh, in addition to the uh, letters that we sent to um, uh, you know, thousands of, of tenants who uh, may be facing eviction warrants uh, from prior to the pandemic, um, there have been larger efforts um, to get the word out about the availability of legal information and advice and access to legal representation. So earlier in the spring, uh, with the launch of the tenant helpline that's accessible by 311, uh, we partnered with the mayor's office to protect tenants, uh, the public engagement unit, um, and put something in the neighborhood of 1.4 million, uh, million postcards uh, into uh, neighborhoods identified as high need. Uh, with the, uh, the information about if you've got questions, if you're facing an eviction, call 311 so you can get some legal help. Um, on the, that's sort of at a broad level. At a more micro level, one thing that we have put in place now that we are launching this uh, sort of novel effort to have legal services uh, providers uh, present and assisting and able to offer full legal representation to those who uh, respond to these uh, motions to enforce the warrants uh, is that we are working with those providers to identify those tenants who don't. And uh, we're working out the kinks, whether it's- Time expires. They who reach out or the providers themselves who reach out, uh, we're happy to be reaching out uh, in any way we can to that uh, you know, now identified number of tenants who are, uh, potentially facing uh, a warrant of eviction and uh, and for whatever reason did not uh, respond to that motion, did not appear in court, did not appear in the virtual conference to offer them uh, access to free legal representation. So uh, we're trying to work out outreach on both sides. Chair, with your permission, can I ask um, the panel to keep answering my questions? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. So um, another question, Jordan, was do you think that um, are the nonprofits being paid adequately for the service we're asking them to do? Yeah, I mean, I look, when, when we talk about the budget for uh, right to counsel. Um, what we're talking about is a budget for nonprofit legal work. Um, mm -hmm. This is a budget that, uh, even in the face of uh, tremendous budget constraints, um, still grew and grew substantially in fiscal year 21 as compared to fiscal year 20, and is a far cry from what legal services uh, was funded at uh, back in fiscal year 2013, um, before the beginning of the administration. So. I think our I, I, I think our investment is sound, and we continue to work with providers to make sure to make funding available, to make resources available, um, if they're able to make use of it. I, I think that there are external factors, and maybe some of the providers will speak to this, um, that could limit capacity. Um, and now more than ever, uh, there are issues around onboarding and uh, around identifying, uh, not just any old attorney, but an attorney uh, to hire or to uh, promote or uh, who is dedicated to the work and will be doing the work at the kind yeah. of levels that we all want to see. Yeah. Uh, so 
So I think, you know, we continue to work through those issues and uh, obviously capacity continues to grow and, and we think we're in a good place. I guess where I would leave that is, I look forward to hearing the testimony from the providers. I'm gonna posit that they could use more funding. Um, and I'm also gonna posit we're in a fiscal crisis, so I get it, but also facing the largest, you know, eviction crisis that we've ever lived through in our lives. Um, I forget what my third question was now. So I guess we're gonna leave it that. And if you remember, you can answer I, it. I, I, I don't, and I'm not just saying that. It was the, the excitement of the I think we hit it. Distracted. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chase. Thank you, Thank you Councilman. Seeing no additional council member questions, we'll turn back to the chairs for a second round of questioning, if you have any more. Actually, I think my colleagues have been pretty thorough in asking the questions, some of which were on my mind as well. So I, I don't have another question. Chair Lansman? Yeah, I do want to drill down a little bit on the, um, the one-shot applications. And, and probably this is more uh, for um, Ms. Drinkwater, uh, and, and less for, for, for Mr. Dressler. But, but whoever can answer it, I'm, I'll take it. Um, how are the one-shot applications by tenants who have not yet been served with rent demand notices um, prioritized relative to those who, who have been served? Thank you for the question. Um, so we, we look at and take into consideration the applications based on individual circumstances. Obviously we have resources that in other circumstances have not been made available uh, to individuals who have not been able to pay their rent due to loss of employment or loss of income. Um, namely the state uh, administered DHCR program uh, for COVID rent relief. Um, so we look at sort of the totality of circumstances in which a client is coming uh, before the agency in need of a one-shot deal to pay rental assistance and or utility assistance, um, recognizing that we want to prioritize um, those who are facing an eviction proceeding. And I don't know if Jordan wants to add anything. I defer to you, that's fine. Um, and how is HRA coordinating with OCJ and legal services providers to ensure that tenants who have eviction cases are able to access rental assistance? I can speak to that briefly. Um, as, the, uh, as the emergency uh, unfolded and as the court uh, reopened uh, to hear cases that already involved uh, attorneys on both sides, um, uh, the Homelessness Prevention Administration of HRA um, set up a, a, a special email address, special protocol, um, so that legal services providers could reach out directly and prioritize uh, those applications, highlight those applications as they related to uh, cases that were now uh, ongoing and could be uh, uh, settled and resolved. Um, and so that was something that was put in place uh, uh, sometime between March and now, um, uh, probably have been up for a couple of months now. Um, and that's been just another sort of tool in the toolbox in uh, the triaging and highlighting where there are acute needs. And um, in, in holdover cases, not the, the non-payment cases, but in, but in holdover cases, um, are there additional resources or initiatives that HRA has to offer tenants who are facing uh, homelessness? Like if, they're, if their lease is up or they're um, in an unregulated apartment? Well, I mean, I, I, I think the, 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 the fact of a holdover proceeding brought against a tenant does not necessarily mean that that tenant is going to be evicted. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the work of our legal services providers to uh, uh, either eliminate or, or delay uh, that possibility um, through, uh, uh, you know, highlighting legal issues, bringing motions um, is real and uh, is uh, something that has to be considered here. Um, 
So I think, you know, the, the, the fact of illegal inter intervention alone um, is obviously a, a defense uh, to an eviction proceeding. Okay, thank you very much. All right, seeing no additional questions, we will now turn to testimony from members of the public. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our in-person council hearings, we'll be calling on individuals one by one to testify. Once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will set the timer and announce you may begin. Your testimony will be limited to two minutes. I would now like to welcome Michael McKee, followed by Lauren Price. Time starts now. Uh, good morning, or I guess it's afternoon by now. Uh, Chair Cornegy, uh, Chair um, uh, Lanceman and other members of the council. My name is Michael McKee. I'm the treasurer of the Tenants Political Action Committee. Um, I'm not going to read my uh, written testimony, which I assume you will see. Uh, I want to start out by praising the city of New York for making a real effort to make sure that tenants get representation and advice. Um, there's a lot we can criticize the city for, and I won't go into that, um, but I think it's very clear that both the um, administration as well as the courts are making a real genuine effort to make sure that tenants have access to advice and representation. The council is largely responsible for this also in terms of the recent uh, uh, changes you've made to providing more funding for legal representation. It's been a very big sea change and I'm sure Jenny Laurie of Housing Court Answers will be able to testify more about this. Um, I'm urging you to do everything you can to persuade the state of New York, the state legislature and the governor to extend the moratorium on evictions beyond October 1st. Uh, we are supporting a, a, a bill by Senator Zelnor Myrie of Brooklyn and assembly member Karen Carinas Reyes of Bronx that would extend the moratorium statewide uh, for the duration of the emergency and a time uh, after that. Um, if this is not, if this doesn't happen, we're going to have a disaster on our hands, which all of you understand. And this will be much worse for communities of color, low income tenants who have already been uh, disproportionately impacted by this virus. So I'm urging you to do everything you can to persuade the state legislature to pass this bill and the governor to sign it before we have a disaster on our hands. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll now hear from Laurel, from Lauren Price, followed by Michael Etroff. Time starts now. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Lauren Price. I'm a senior staff attorney at the Civil Justice Practice at Brooklyn Defender Services. I'm also co-chair of the Brooklyn Tenant Lawyers Network, which is an association of legal services lawyers who represent tenants in Kings County. I want to be clear that based on what I've heard here today, the CDC moratorium through the end of the year is far from short of universal. It only protects a very specific subset of people with the burden on the tenant to prove that they fall under its protections. It will not prevent an influx of housing court cases. It will not prevent eviction of the 42% of unregulated tenants in the city, and it will not prevent landlords from inventing causes to evict the rest. Merely assigning representation to tenants without tenants' rights protected, and more importantly, arrears assistance will not stem the tide of evictions. In fact, I've already received a motion requesting to evict my client immediately after October 1st on a no-cause holdover case based on lease expiration. My client had agreed to move out of the apartment by the end of March, before she even had the chance the city shut down. We need urgent action on a local level and within the next two weeks, otherwise the city is guaranteed to face an eviction crisis and an unprecedented homeless populations as there is no affordable housing left in the city. This will of course bring out about a new wave of infections, much like COVID, this crisis will disparately impact black and other tenants of color in New York City. We need legislative and policy solutions and I echo Mr. McKee's support of the uh, legislation in the state level. At my office, we have an affordable housing search specialist who assists clients with the challenges of relocation. This week, she reported nine available apartments citywide within the price range for city vouchers and only seven available within the entire lottery housing system. Within 24 hours, all of the listings were gone. This is before the eviction crisis has even begun. 
However, there are steps that the city can take to address this crisis. First, the city must extend a universal eviction moratorium. Or in two short weeks, we'll see an influx of housing court cases in an unsafe courthouse and mass evictions shortly thereafter. We also support, of course, um, all of the efforts to extend rental assistance, and we urge HRA to expand eligibility for that assistance. Thank you for the opportunity to appear today and discuss these issues. Thank you. I, Rob, I have a question if, if you're not gonna, if you don't have one. Yes, no, I have no questions. Okay. Um, Ms. Price, you used the term unsafe courthouses. Is, is that uh, anything in particular you want to tell us that what we might want to urge DCAS and OCA to, to, to deal with, or you just mean generally in the context of we're in the middle of a pandemic and you know, people shouldn't be forced to, to congregate? Of course, generally in the context of a pandemic, but particularly in the courthouse that I practice in, 141 Livingston, um, there's been plenty of publicity around the city about how this is a uniquely unsafe building. Um, Ms. Razak testified that a lot of the trials and hearings that are going to be happening will be taking place at the Supreme Court building in Brooklyn, which is somewhat better. At least it's a modern building where I think there are air filters, but um, 141 is not usable. And that's where these motions about eviction execution will be taking place. Mine is scheduled for the second week of October. I don't have to appear in person because I'm a lawyer. I can come on Skype, but unrepresented tenants or people who don't get connected with counsel before the hearing takes place will have to be there. Additionally, this is a terrifying proposition to get a motion that says you're the landlord wants to act on this eviction notice. I'm sure people will be flooding the courthouse when they start getting them in October and beyond. We're going to hear from a lot of legal services providers, but you're, you're the first one uh, up. So um, could you share with us the challenges we, of representing people uh, virtually, particularly where some of these people might um, have difficulty accessing the kind of technology that, that you and I are able to in our, our fancy offices and homes? You're, you're muted. I've unmuted. I, I'll have to have permission to unmute. There you go. Um, I, yes, virtual appearances are challenging. It's not the same as appearing in person. There's obviously the awkwardness of communication. And for my clients, even if they have perhaps a smartphone and perhaps it has a video that they can turn on, that doesn't mean they have a space that's quiet. I barely have a space that's quiet. You can hear the construction outside of my home. For people who are in less stable or overcrowded housing, this is even more of a challenge. And that doesn't even get to people with disabilities or with limited English language ability who aren't able to express themselves in this kind of environment. Good afternoon. And how would you um, describe your the, the work that, that you've done with um, the Office of Civil Justice or your organization has done the Office of Civil Justice to adjust to, to this reality? I think that question is probably better answered by some of the offices that are assigned um, in the Universal Access Program. We've received some referrals from the Office of Civil Justice, but we aren't one of the um, Universal Access Providers. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. We will now have questions from Council Member Cohen. Time starts now. Thank you very much. I just got the pizza, the bite of pizza I was having down. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for taking the time to testifying. Uh, again, I guess I'm focusing on the same, the same theme. Um, you're particularly concerned about uh, the start of October. Uh, again, I, I'm not convinced that the, the, the courthouse has the capacity um, to process uh, new cases in any significant volume. Uh, do you have a sense of, or I guess, what is the basis or or what do you think the capacity is going to be? Like, will there really be an avalanche all at once? Um, are we going to have an opportunity to kind of deal with this in a, in a, in a, in a at a pace that we can, can handle? Um, I mean, you obviously seem very concerned that, 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 that uh, it's sort of a, a catechis catechismic date that the, the beginning of October. Could you just talk about what you think the basis of that concern is and what you think the court capacity is? I know that I've heard from my colleagues on the other side of the, of the bar 
landlords attorneys that their clients are eager to start evictions. I know that people are starting to receive these motions and they've just, the court has just started accepting them and they're already flooding into our offices. And whether the court is able to calendar them all quickly, I'm sure they're doing their best to be efficient, but I, I think the idea of what number is acceptable isn't a question we should be asking. No one should be facing evictions at this time. Well, I mean, I, I understand that if there's a, we, we don't want to destabilize the housing stock to the point where, I mean, like the system has to work at, at, on some level. We have to come up with a solution. Um, I guess, I guess I'm very concerned about that. I guess what the, what the ultimate resolution is going to be and how this is going to get resolved. And obviously we have this, this is the system we have uh, and, and for people to have the opportunity to contest uh, addiction cases. And I wanna make sure that that's done fairly, but I also, I guess I have some doubt that uh, it's going to happen, you know, which I think is, is good for tenants in an expeditious way. I think that return dates are gonna, you know, are gonna be very, it's gonna take a long time and that might give us the opportunity to sort this out in a way that's obviously fair and equitable. I hope that's true. And I think that, you know, the second part of this solution, which I briefly mentioned and will elaborate on our written testimony is rental assistance and, you know, ensuring that people who are out of, of the ability to pay their rent through no faults of their own and who won't recover that ability for quite a long time, even as the city partially reopens, have the ability to repay their rent and, and make creative solutions with landlords. People are in homes, homeless people can't stay home, right? So the natural conclusion for me is that we should fund and incentivize landlords to keep those tenants in the homes that they already have. Now, I, I, obvious, I agree with that, obviously. All right, thank you very much, Chairs. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next, we have questions from Council Member Rosenthal. Time starts now. Council Member, you're breaking up a little bit. Council member Rosenthal, we, it seems that you're having some audio issues. You know, I guess I'm wondering, I am, so sorry. Um, what, oh dear. Now your audio is Sorry, I'll be delaying that. Um, my question is to the lawyers whether or not they think the one shots are sufficient in other words um do we need more than one shots i think we need more than one shots i think that we need one they need to be not exclusively one-time assistance there's a lot of limits on one shot deals that i'm sure my colleagues can elaborate on but that they are um limited only to rental arrears in non-payment cases where there's a possessory judgment in place. So that's usually at the conclusion or the last agreement that is made in a housing court case and then a judgment is entered and you know there's a risk of eviction. Um, HRA should expand that eligibility for one-shot deals and call them, uh, we should call them rental assistance, arrears assistance because it shouldn't just be one time. Um, so that eligibility should be available not only for possessory judgments but perhaps even before a housing court case is started. They should also be available in um, holdover proceedings where the offer of rental arrears might incentivize a landlord to keep a tenant who's already there. Um, I mentioned earlier that almost half of the housing stock is unregulated housing stock. So landlords, we have heard this from many, many clients that landlords will cycle in a family out of shelter because they get a, a big bonus for taking them. They'll agree to one year lease with a FEPS voucher 
And then after that year is over, maybe the rental limits have increased with FAPS and they say, why not start again? Why not get a new bonus? They'll evict that family and start fresh with a new bonus and a new round of funding from the city. The incentive needs to go the other way and the landlords need to be have a reason to keep families in place and not cycle families in and out of shelter, which certainly costs the city more and is incredibly traumatizing to our clients. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, appreciate you. Any more questions from our chairs? Yeah, uh, uh, to the attorneys, I do have a question. Um, we, I, I find myself and the city finds itself in this precarious position where we're trying to support uh, and prevent evictions, but also support and prevent foreclosures of small homeowners. So the one to four family homeowners who have provided in some instances, a great pathway to affordable housing for tenants now find themselves in, in, in a lurch and there's no coordinated effort to save the homes while saving, while staving off eviction, uh, what would be your prescription for us as city government to be able to literally walk and chew gum at the same time? I think this relief needs to extend to small homeowners as well, particularly those of these kind of units. I don't think that that's all of the landlords in New York City, um, but we absolutely support assistance to them. Rental relief helps landlords too, and that's what we want the council to implement. Okay. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Lauren. Um, we have additional legal service providers actually also coming up to testify. Next up is Jonathan Fox, followed by Elizabeth Clayroy. Time starts now. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to start my camera. Give me one second. Sorry about that. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Carnegie Lansman. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak at 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 today's hearing on the potential eviction crisis in the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Jonathan Fox and I'm the director of the Tenants' Rights Unit at the New York Legal Assistance Group. Uh, the City Council's trailblazing initiative to pass the first right to counsel and housing court law in the nation in 2017 demonstrated the city's commitment to preserving housing security for all New Yorkers. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic and the severe economic hardship it has wrought, which has had a profound disparate impact on communities of color, the right to counsel law functions as an enduring bulwark to keep New Yorkers in their homes. With an array of state and federal eviction moratoria and, ex and, and an extremely complex rent stabilization legal landscape, the funding the city council provides to right to council providers enables tenants citywide to get skilled legal representation in defense of their homes. This legal representation was critical to preserving New Yorkers' homes and communities before the pandemic and is even more important now with so many New Yorkers facing pandemic related housing insecurity. Public policy should favor keeping people in, in, in their homes. The scope of this crisis with its potential to make many thousands of individuals and families homeless mandates swift action from all levels of government to ensure that a crisis of rent arrears does not become a humanitarian crisis. Without substantial rent relief assistance, black and brown communities would bear the brunt of the economic devastation. Already endemic race-based inequalities would would be further amplified. New York should not through inaction allow communities of color to suffer the most during this pandemic and the eventual recovery. NILAG urges the city council to pass a resolution to encourage New York uh, state legislature to pass the emergency housing stability and tenant displacement. Expired. Thank you. We now have, we, we will now hear from Elizabeth Clay Roy followed by Nakib Siddiq. And time starts now. 
Thank you to the council chairs, members, and staff for your work to help the city through this crisis. My name is Elizabeth Clay Roy. I'm the executive director of Take Root Justice, a legal services organization that serves over 2,000 clients across New York City each year to advance racial and economic justice. Our team works side by side with tenants as they fight against gentrification to demand better living conditions, affordable rent, and voice in the policies that shape their neighborhoods. This advocacy has resulted in millions of dollars worth of repairs in low-income housing and kept New Yorkers in their homes. A safe place to live is personal protective equipment in 2020, crucial for families to prevent and recover from the virus. Our collective investment in housing stability should therefore be a priority for everyone. We support the extension of the moratorium, specifically the Emergency Housing Stability and Displacement Prevention Act now in the New York State Senate. The moratorium has done more to prevent homelessness in the past five years than any other government action in recent history, which is an important lesson in and of itself. Um, and we know uh, it's been described um, the, that there could be as many as 1 million new eviction filings in New York in the first four months after the moratorium expires. This wave of, of evictions will crash into a safety net full of holes. Many tenants will be ineligible for the one-time rental assistance because of a permanent loss of income and ineligible from the rent, uh, rental voucher programs because their rents are too high. And Black and Latinx tenants um, who've already been disproportionately devastated by the pandemic will face the brunt of this eviction crisis. No single action will be enough by itself, but there are two important bills before the council now that we believe are crucial to preventing mass evictions and homelessness. Intro 2050 to impl fully implement a right to council that will fully implement a right to counsel um, in housing court for all zip codes um, is essential and in intro 146 to raise uh, city rental voucher payments to the HUD fair market rent, bringing vouchers within reach of thousands of households who have lost income during the pandemic. Time expired. And at last I'll briefly say um, that landlords are ramping up harassment in this climate, which is um, disturbing, but not surprising. Um, and we're litigating emergency harassment cases of many landlords who despite the moratorium um, are harassing um, their tenants verbally, physically, um, and um, that work um, in fact uh, is um, critically important to continue um, as this crisis unfolds. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. You will now hear from Nakib Siddiq, followed by Ayla Trinidad. And time starts now. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Cornegie, Chair Lansman, Council, uh, Council, Council, and the Sergeants at Arms. Um, I, I'm not going to read from my testimony. Uh, we will submit that. It's uh, about 20 pages. I want to thank my colleague Ellen Davidson for pulling that together. Um, so I, I will mostly focus on housing court and Brooklyn housing court. That's what I know before I started working from home, uh, that was my other home, uh, 141 Livingston Street. And there are some specific uh, recommendations and ideas that the Legal Aid Society has um, to deal with this unprecedented challenge as the courts reopen. I just wanna first, you know, just maybe bring us all back to March 13th, 2020. Uh, that's the day that I'll certainly remember uh, that Friday, that was the last day that I was at 141 Livingston Street uh, certainly. And uh, there was a lot of fear. There was a lot of fear and panic in the courthouse. Uh, and it was one of those times when you really see, in some ways, the mask come off. Um, it's a, one of these times when I uh, had that visceral feeling of, you know, that our clients have when they're at that building, uh, the sense of abandonment and fear. Uh, it was palpable. And I think it's important for us to remember to remember, or at least to remember not to forget that, Obviously, we know what happened and uh, the devastation that was inflicted on our city and uh, poor people in the city, especially uh, the majority of them, people of color. Uh, so, you know, first of all, we, we have sort of four recommendations, I think, in terms of housing court that uh, to some degree, the others, uh, the others who testified have uh, addressed some of these issues. I mean, first of all, we must expend the, extend the eviction moratorium. Right, if we allow evictions to take place now at the cusp of a second wave, we will be flooding homeless shelters, subways, streets at the very moment that we need to maintain the status quo to prevent the death toll, which has already been so devastating, uh, 25,000 at least in the city, from climbing any further. Time expired. Uh, I, I just, you know, second thing I would say is that, you know, we want to make sure that we have that, uh, the, if, if equity requires that if people are mandated to come to court, especially low-income people of color, 
they should be able to appear virtually at any time without the need to prove any medical exemption. We also need to make sure, thirdly, that OCA ensures a maximum degree of safety for in-person appearances. And DCAS here, I think, has a special role. They really need to be forthcoming and transparent about the work that they're doing. 141 Livingston Street, I'll say, uh, you know, nobody thinks that that building could be made safe as a venue. It was wrong before the pandemic as a place uh, to bring in litigants, especially poor people, and it's certainly wrong now. You know, and finally, uh, we must provide rent relief. Uh, attorneys are necessary, absolutely, but they're not sufficient. We need a subsidy program to support any tenant family who's rent burdened and access to rent arrears for both undocumented families as well and rules barring landlords from bringing non-payment cases for apartments with hazardous violations. With these recommendations, we hope that the city can work to ensure that uh, in New York City's housing courts reflect the best of our city and our collective will to protect the most vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you. We will next hear from Ayla Trinidad, followed by Jenny Lori. And time starts now. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Ayla Trinidad, and I am an investigative process server with Manhattan Legal Services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today in front of all of you about COVID-19 and the impact the court system has on low-income litigants and their representatives. As you know, at Legal Services, our focus is providing free legal services to low-income New Yorkers, including those facing eviction in housing court. My comments today focus primarily on what we are seeing in housing court. Evictions are a public health crisis and a violent act to communities and families. This is even more so in the midst of a pandemic, when displacing someone from their home through either legal or extra legal means tears them out of the safest space available to protect them against the virus. Mental health is at risk, along with physical health and safety of New Yorkers. Job loss from the pandemic has caused unemployment to skyrocket, and each month an increasing number of New Yorkers are unable to pay rent. Homeless New Yorkers are 61% more likely to die from COVID-19 than those who are housed. To protect New Yorkers and all of our communities, it is imperative that we keep people in their homes. Black Lives Matter. Communities of color in New York are bearing the brunt of the virus's impact. Black and brown New Yorkers are more likely to be essential workers who cannot perform their jobs remotely, more likely to live in overcrowded conditions, exposing them to others who may carry the virus. They are also more likely to have to ride crowded means of transportation, which do not allow for social distancing as recommended by the CDC. And they are more likely to be uninsured or underinsured and face discrimination in healthcare and housing. Although average COVID rates are low across New York, these averages mass significantly higher rates in communities of color. Opening the courts will do nothing but make more for more exposure to essential workers and to New York's most vulnerable. The decision to begin holding in-person trials forces the poorest and most expired. vulnerable New Yorkers. Thank you for allowing me to testify today. Thank you. We will now hear from Jenny Lori, followed by Suhali Mendez. Like the time starts now. Uh, thank you very much to uh, Chairs Carnegie and Lanceman for holding this hearing. Um, it's really important, I think, for the City Council to do as much as possible to control the impending eviction crisis. Um, Housing Court Answers has been running a hotline, thanks in part to initiative, in large part, to initiative funding from the New York City Council for tenants and small landlords with questions and problems related to the moratorium, eviction preventions, getting enough food. Um, income support, lease tenancy rights. We've been assisting folks with um, illegal lockouts and emergency housing conditions following emergency HP actions. Um, our call volume has increased tremendously in recent weeks now that landlords can file new cases and restore old cases. Housing Court Answers urges the City Council to pass Intro 2050, which would allow the city to implement the 2017 Right to Council Law which many have talked about today and has had a tremendous effect on um, decreasing evictions in New York City. Um, the intro 250 would call for immediate implementation rather than phased in implementation. Right now, tenants facing eviction on these new warrant cases uh, get counsel, but there's no word on what will happen once the court opens more and ca more cases are calendared. 
Um, over the past six months, landlords have filed about 8,000 non-payment cases and 2,000 holdover cases, which is much lower than would be in normal times, and clearly we're not in normal times. We also urge, um, obviously, um, federal money at the level of the CARES Act to um, deal with the epidemic and um, an extensive moratorium uh, to be passed on the state level, as others have suggested. Um, thanks again to the City Council for all your support um, in this crisis. It's been really important. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Saya Hegda, um, who will be the end of our legal service providers. Uh, they will be followed by uh, Melissa Sklarts and Damon Rowe. Time Good starts now. Good afternoon. My name is Sia Hegde, and I am a staff attorney with the Bronx Defenders Civil Action Practice. As civil public defenders in the Bronx, we defend against the countless enmeshed civil consequences that stem from legal system involvement. We regularly witness the spiraling catastrophic impact of the city's housing crisis on the lives of our clients and their families as they try to keep or secure stable, affordable quality housing. We recognize housing as a fundamental human right and that housing is health. In the last six months, our clients with criminal cases have been subjected to temporary orders of protection leading to de facto evictions. Criminal courts refuse to hold hearings regarding these orders, instead referring clients to housing court, which lacks the authority or ability to modify them. Our clients have also been illegally locked out of their homes and we have conducted emergency hearings to prevent homelessness. Our clients who are essential workers have had their occupational licenses suspended. And we have argued for the reinstatement of these licenses to avoid potential eviction. Our clients in non-payment eviction proceedings struggle to secure timely public benefits and sufficient rent assistance before the impending end of the eviction moratorium on October 1st. We are deeply concerned about the state elected officials and courts failure to take proactive comprehensive action in response to the housing crisis. We need broad concrete rent relief passed so that low income renters who otherwise face the imminent threat of an eviction are protected. We support the housing, the emergency housing stability and displacement prevention act for a universal moratorium, the rent and mortgage cancellation act and the housing access voucher program. While none of these pending bills would single handedly solve the crisis, they would go further than any piecemeal effort at the state or local level to date. As a member of a proud provider of the expanding right to counsel in housing court, the Bronx Defenders urges the city council to give voice to the urgent need for state governmental action. Moreover, you should work to eliminate the enmeshed civil consequences based on criminal and other legal system involvement. These consequences are an extension of punitive and carceral systems that exacerbate the housing crisis. Thank you for your time, council. Thank you. And before we move on, I'd like to just pause in case any council members have questions for legal service providers before we move on to our next witnesses. Uh, I just want to mention, I think we've been joined by council member Debbie Rose. Okay. All right, seeing none, we'll move on to Melissa Sklartz, followed by Damon Rowe and Esteban Giron. Melissa? And time starts now. Great. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So my name is Melissa Sklars. I'm the Senior Government Relations Strategist at SAGE. Uh, we're dedicated to improving the lives of LGBT elders. I'm going to ask everyone just to do a slight pivot instead of focusing on wage-based evictions uh, to ponder age-based evictions. For older New Yorkers, the, there was a crisis before COVID-19. Um, when you think of LGBT elders and you think of LGBT elders, most of whom are people of color, 20% of New York City LGBT elders are people of color. 33% of elders are poor uh, and, and struggling with housing stability. 40% of uh, people of color LGBT elders are poor and struggling with both food and housing. Uh, LGBT elders have isolation, discrimination, HIV and poverty. Um, and now as COVID seems to overwhelm our city and what happens next when the moratorium expires, all of our elders and non-LGBT elders are gonna be at risk. SAGE with the partners in the city council has been able to start creating LGBT friendly affordable housing in New York. We have our Stonewall House in Fort Greene in Brooklyn on the Ingersoll campus. Uh, by the end of the year, we hope to be opening a second house on Cretona North in the Bronx uh, safe, clean, state-of-the-art housing for LGBT-friendly elders, along with our safe centers and our services. 
Um, we have done everything that we can possibly do. We are so grateful for the support of the of the council. We've been a, a good neighbor and a good supporter. We've been supporting moratorium evictions. We're grateful to Judge Marks for the extension to October 1st. We support this Tenant Safe Harbor Act. We look forward to continuing working with our friends in the council, make sure that LGBT elders have safe, affordable housing here in New York. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. Next, we'll hear from Damon Rowe, followed by Esteban Garan and Sandra Mitchell. Damon? And time starts Thank now. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Damon Rowe, and I'm the Director of Special Projects at the Osborne Association, which is a nonprofit organization that provides programs for individuals affected by incarceration, including people in prisons and jails, their children, and their families. And I'd like to highlight a few issues in my uh, written testimony. The city's use of hotels to provide housing to people in homeless shelters and people returning from jail or prison has been a sensible step to prevent the spread of COVID-19. However, the passion-driven reaction that we've seen to the hotels brings light to the, fa the fact that we don't have a viable housing strategy for people leaving jail or prison. We were heartened to see that the diversity of recommendations in the council's the Case for Change report on the homelessness crisis that was released by the speaker at the beginning of the year included recommendation, recommendations sorry, that would target this pressing need, including a state funding, for, a state funding program for transitional housing, housing amending the New York City 1515 supportive housing program so people leaving incarceration are no longer excluded, and revising the NYCHA rules that prevent justice-involved people from being reunited with their families in public housing. As Osborne and other social service providers and public interest organizations have advocated, the NYCHA exclusions for justice-involved people are particularly harmful while we're all dealing with the housing consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic. Eviction, particularly evictions by a public agency, the largest provider of affordable housing in the city, should not be a consequence of providing shelter to a loved one during a crisis. We must also recognize that blanket approaches do not adequately serve thousands of formerly incarcerated people, many of whom aren't classified as chronically homeless until they spend months in the shelter or on the streets post-release. So to respond to the ways that the COVID-19 has and will continue to exacerbate the city's housing crisis, we recommend that this, the council pursue an integrated strategy that allows for governmental and non-governmental actors to provide a full spectrum of housing options that does not discriminate against people returning from prison or jail. Only such a model will create a system that allows everyone to have a home. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like we have a question from council member Rosenthal. Time starts. Great, thank you. Um, this is really for Melissa um, or anyone, but Melissa, have you seen people actually be evicted during COVID? In other words, are you working with anyone now who was not homeless before, but is now homeless and possibly in shelter? This was for Elizabeth, you said? Melissa Scott. Sorry, I missed the question. Councilmember, can you repeat the question? You may have lost her connection. The answer is yes. All right, Austin. Oh, no. Oh, you're back. Go for it. Nope, we lost you again. Just one moment, we'll try and sort this out. We're gonna move on to the next witness. Um, we will now hear from Jared Trujillo, followed by Esteban Giron and then Sandra Mitchell. Time starts now.
see, Jared? He might not be there. Let's see. Okay, we will move forward with Esteban Giron. Try to circle back to Jared in the next round. So Esteban Giron. The time starts now. Good afternoon, my name is Esteban Giron. I'm a tenant and a member of the Crown Heights Tenant Union. And I also serve on the board of directors of Tenants Pack. Um, in mid-March of this year, my husband and I were seriously ill for several weeks with COVID-19. As a result, we found ourselves facing significant increase in expenses, falling behind on our rent almost immediately. Five months later, I'm not back to normal. I'm gonna skip the rest of my written testimony, but I just wanna add that we need to cancel rent entirely. That's the only solution. Um, I wanna alert you to the fact that landlords are getting desperate. They're using illegal lockouts, severe harassment, intimidation, other forms of self-help evictions. And to respond to that in preparation for the deluge of evictions that we're expect expecting, uh, we've started just forming our own networks of uh, eviction defense, like Brooklyn Eviction Defense. Um, I want to address uh, Council Member Cohen's concerns about having a fair process for landlords to be able to bring evictions. There's nothing fair about landlords being able to evict folks during a deadly pandemic. Remember that the context here is that for somebody like me, who would not survive a second bout of COVID, evictions equal death, and we're not going to let our neighbors die, nor will we go willingly to meet our end. Um, the last thing I'll say is that there is one thing that this council can do to not be complicit in our landlord's plans to remove us from our homes so that there's space for richer, wider tenants. You can do that by rejecting rezoning applications like Industry City. Land use decisions right now impact primarily low-income tenants of color, the ones already dying by the thousands. The hotels and strip malls and luxury towers planned for our neighborhoods will cost lives. Don't do it. Don't let that be your legacy. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Sam. Next, we're here, we'll hear, hear from Sandra Mitchell, followed by Heidi Villanueva and Robbie Parks. Sandra? Time starts now. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I want to thank the Honorable Chairs Carnegie, Lansman, and all the council members and champion speakers for creating this space for our voices to be heard. Uh, my name is Chaplain Sandra Mitchell, and I am a New Settlement Apartments CASA leader, and CASA stands for Community Action for Safe Apartments. By profession, I am a specially trained and skilled mental health advocate, trainer, counselor, and group facilitator, and I'm also a Right to Counsel Coalition startup member. More importantly, I am a registered voter and a survivor of the court system and shelter system. I would like to speak to you briefly about um, the need to extend the universal eviction moratorium and ensure that everyone facing eviction is well informed and offered and has the direct means to obtain the right to counsel. In reference to extending the universal moratorium, the state acknowledged that the inhumanity of evictions during COVID-19, but however, that acknowledgement of throwing people out of their homes to become homeless and directly exposed to COVID-19 is beyond hu humane. It is savage, it's an abomination. The eviction moratorium needs to be extended at least one year after the pandemic is over. Evicting tenants during a, a global pandemic will cripple the city's economy and raise the death toll astronomically. We are urging the, the city council to extend the universal moratorium. Secondly, ensuring that everyone facing eviction is well informed and is giving express access to the right to counsel. Every human being deserves the right to counsel and to be allowed express direct access to it. During my court uh, case of eviction, I did not have the right to counsel. The right to counsel did not exist. And that's why I fought to help to create the right to counsel. And I made sure that as I walked through the courts, everyone received information on their right. Time expired. I'll just say this in closing, please. Uh, we, we are better than this. We do not want to have leave a legacy, our legacy to be destroyed as New York City, the epicenter of the world. We need to save lives, save homes, save our economy, save New York City by making absolutely certain that the right to counsel is made law in the entire state of New York and across the country. Make right to counsel universal states law and make sure that we extend the eviction moratorium until this pandemic is over. Thank you and God bless you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Heidi Villanueva, followed by Richard Velasquez and Theo Chino. Time starts now. 
Good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. I'm Haiti Villanueva. I'm a CASA member and a Bronx constituent. Our Bronx community has been affected from decades of disinvestment and racist government policies, creating a housing crisis that has been going on for far too long. This is why the COVID-19 pandemic has disproportionately affected us, making the housing crisis even worse. We need action from government now. That's why I'm here today asking you to meet our demands to avoid thousands of evictions. I think it's necessary to extend the universal eviction moratorium for at least a year after this crisis ends. Evictions are considered inhumane and they're very stressful. It is unfair to make people go through one in the middle of a health and economic crisis. Things are really bad right now. Thousands of people haven't been able to pay their rent for months because they have lost their jobs once we were forced to be quarantined. Now they are jobless and we cannot allow them to also be homeless. We need the government to protect the health of our people and sending them to crowded shelters where they can't properly have social distance is not safe. If our representatives are going to allow eviction cases to start, then they have to ensure everyone facing eviction has and knows about the right to counsel so they can fight for justice and for their homes. We have a right to counsel bill, but it is not for everyone. We demand your support to make it universal by helping us pass the intro 2050 that would amend the local law to require immediate implementation of right to counsel. Once the eviction cases start, they should be slowed down in order to prevent crowding in the courts. It shouldn't be allowed for landlords to file eviction cases in the middle of a crisis, but if you're going to allow them to do so, at least hold them accountable and prioritize cases that uphold tenants' rights over landlords' rights. We need to prioritize health and safety and accessibility in courts for our community. Thank you for letting me share this testimony. I'm looking forward to seeing how our demand- Time expired. Thank you. You will now hear from Richard Velasquez, followed by Theo Chino and Carlton Burroughs. Richard? Uh, time starts now. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Richard Velasquez, and I'm a law graduate of God Riverside Law Projects, a nonprofit legal services provider. I would like to give an advocate's perspective on the imminent eviction crisis and touch on some issues which haven't been discussed much. It goes without saying that many people were affected by COVID-19 in one way or another. This was no one in particular's fault, and people should not continue to suffer by going to court in the midst of dealing with illness, death, trauma, and or loss of income. However, I would like to emphasize that the people most affected by this pandemic, as well as the groups more likely to be behind in rent and subject to eviction, are black and brown folks of lower income communities. At Goddard, we have had dozens of folks call since the beginning of quarantine asking for advice or representation. And nearly every caller has been affected in some way by COVID-19, and the majority of callers also stem from lower income minority communities. Moreover, at Goddard, we have a long history of advance of advocating on behalf of SRO tenants, and they're even more disproportionately impacted by the same issues impacting tenants in general. There are also many ways in which folks have been impacted by COVID-19, which go beyond loss of income or being behind in rent. Many are still recovering, grieving, and traumatized, in addition to the additional financial burdens associated with healthcare costs, funerals, and supporting one's family, which are often not discussed. Whereas there should be a multifaceted approach which focuses on people's health and financial responsibilities equally. Accordingly, God would like to echo the demands of the Rights Council Coalition, namely would also call for a halt to all eviction proceedings and a better, more universal eviction moratorium. We would ask that the, that the city continue to support the Right to Council program and its expansion to ensure accessibility to all New Yorkers. Additionally, we ask for a slowdown of court cases once they do resume. Furthermore, we ask that housing be recognized as a human right and accordingly should be protected more proactively by the city. Lastly, we urge that the health, safety, and accessibility to courts be prioritized in a meaningful manner. In conclusion, I understand there's no one-size-fits-all solution to combat this crisis, but simply pushing back court dates or utilizing attorneys as a means to speed up the eviction mode Time without expired. supporting actual relief will not aid in this crisis. If I could just finish this last sentence. As attorneys, we'd like to provide the best representation as possible, and we feel we simply cannot do that if adequate relief is not provided for tenants and due process considerations are addressed. Thank you for this opportunity to testify. Thank you, Richard. We'll now hear from Theo Chino, followed by Carlton Burroughs and Lyric Thompson. Theo? Time starts now. Hi, my name is Theo Chino. Anyone hearing me, please Google my name, T-H-E-O-C-H-I-N-O. -E I'm testifying today because I would like to speak to Councilman Carnegie, and I'm sorry I forgot to put my video. Yes. Uh, 
I run the website showthebook.org and I'm there because we have a problem with HPD. HPD is holding 400,000 units in this city and suddenly we have a problem of eviction. We have a problem because people are homeless. How is that possible when we have that many units that are held by HPD? An investigation needs to be done at HPD and Councilman Corgiman, the last time we talked to Edward Amador, we're still waiting for the email from the document we have submitted your office. So my question to you and my testimony in front of city council is what happened to the thing that your staff promised us that they will look into? There is one minute left. Please give me an answer. Give us an answer because my little army of more than a thousand residents from a thousand buildings all over the city is coming out from now until February and we will help any insurgent candidate to run for office. So this issue will never appear again. Thank you very much for your time. And I would like an answer if possible. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Amador is no longer employed at this office. So would you please resend those documents he hasn't worked here for the last six months, unfortunately. Next up is Carlton Burroughs, followed by Lyric Thompson and Abraham Gross. Carlton? Time starts now. Hello? Hello? We hear you. Oh, OK. Um, my concern is. I, I testified on July 22nd, uh, 2019, and I got a uh, report back that DOI did an investigation and found no fraud. But during my testimony, I submitted documentation that clearly showed the fraud and nothing has been done and we're, we're continuing to suffer. And it appears to me that HPD is above the law. And no agency should be above the law. They're putting pensioners' money at risk uh, through their third-party transfer program. And this is pre-pandemic, during the pandemic, and I'm sure it's going to last after the pandemic. It is important to do a forensic uh, investigation of HPD and the staff of HPD. I don't understand. I've been talking about this for five years now and nothing is being done. Does HPD control the city council? Does HPD control DOI? I have a situation where a DOI report was lifted from a judge's desk. These are all acts that should be looked into. We're on the verge of losing our homes that we paid for. I worked hard to save that money. And now I can lose my home to a predatory lender because HPD controls the city, controls the mayor, controls the media. It shouldn't be like that in America. Somebody at the city council has to be brave enough to step up to this agency and do something about this. And Robert Cornegie, Mr. Cornegie, you know me. You've sat next to me. You, you did a radio show in Harlem and you know this is going on. Somebody has to be brave enough to step up to HPD. I'm expired. And do the right thing. Next up, we have Lyric Thompson, followed by Jared Trujillo and Abraham Gross. Time starts now. Hi, my name is Lyric Thompson, and just an idea. Has anyone ever thought of giving landlords a one-shot deal? Might be a little a little easier to manage than dealing with a whole bunch of tenants. But that said, I'd like to do I'd like to speak about um, illegal evictions and some of the tenant harassment that I'm seeing in in our city. Um, a lot of landlords aren't waiting for the courts; they're just taking the locks off people's doors. In one case, the landlord kicked the door in and tried to move a stranger into this woman's apartment. Now, if that's not disturbing enough. When she dialed 911 and the police showed up, the police told her to get along with her new roommate. That is abusive. She was left battered, broken, and traumatized. Now, I, I'd like to give a shout out to incoming Councilwoman Dharma Diaz, who worked tirelessly with the police to prevent this woman from having this stranger move into her house. But 
you know, the police need to be on the same page with regard to this type of behavior. I called every single precinct we have in this in this city, in the five boroughs, and way too many of them thought it was perfectly illegal for a landlord to kick your door in because he owns the building. That's not illegal. That's not legal. It needs to be prosecuted. Now, I'd like to follow up with Carlton on the HPD situation. Housing preservation and development is at, at the root a corrupt agency. My dealings with HPD is I'm in a 421A building that was never completed. The architectural papers were forged. The public accountant's papers were forged. The original certificate of eligibility was a notarized statement from a woman who had been dead for three years at the time of notary. Now, what did HPD do? Remove it and let him put in another, you know, another document. HPD is well aware that these, these you know, documents are forged, yet they have done absolutely nothing to address the issue of fraud within their own ranks. Now, Councilmember Courtney, you know me too. You've been to my building. I'm expired. This is six years. No citizen should have to deal with a housing agency for six years. I could have literally donated my liver twice. It would have grown back and all of us with new livers could be drinking you know, shots of Jameson in the bar. It's ridiculous. Does anybody have any questions? If anybody would feel the need to, you can Google Willie Zimbrano and see if he signed off the Decatur buildings. He'll tell you no. Any questions from anybody? Seeing none, we'll move to our next panelist. Next up is Jared Tujillo, followed by Abraham Gross and Lauren Springer. Jared? Time, time starts now. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing the Association of Legal Aid Attorneys the opportunity to testify. Uh, we represent 2,000 legal workers, uh, lawyers, paralegals, social workers, and others, um, and all five boroughs, Nassau County and Orange County, and that includes a lot of folks that work in housing court. And while our members ferociously represent all of their clients, it is, it is troubling that uh, in-person eviction trials have been allowed to continue in the housing court. Uh, on August 20th, uh, Chief Judge, I'm sorry, Judge Marks testified that no trials would go forward in person without the express consent of both parties. But we've seen at three different organizations of uh, where I represent members that that has not been the case, where people have been asked to do in-person housing trials without their consent. That not only impacts our my members, but more importantly, that impacts the low-income clients that they represent who already live in communities that have been ravaged by the COVID-19 epidemic. Um, I wanna thank the city for its leadership um, and its investment in the Right to Counsel program. It's not only a moral imperative, but it makes good fiscal sense and it's, a, it's an important investment in human capital. However, more is needed. I recognize that the city has, um, that the city, what the city's budget projections look like. However, Right to Counsel saves the city money. So passing things like uh, intro 1104, which expands the types of cases that are covered by right to counsel, is imperative, even during this economic crisis. Passing uh, uh, intro 1529, which extends tenant organizers, which uh, helps tenants know their rights, and, and it limits the amount of landlord harassment that people face, is imperative at this time. Uh, the acceleration of the right to counsel program, uh, which we've seen the city uh, you know, see really the value in, it's important to make sure that the legal service providers and the unions that represent the lawyers um, and, and paralegals um, are also involved in, in that planning. And I'll be- Time sorry. expired. Uh, last point I just wanna make, uh, housing is more than just about housing, but it's about the people that are excluded from it as well. Uh, passing council member Steve Levin's bill, intro 2047, uh, which would uh, prevent landlords from being able to discriminate against people or ask about criminal records is incredibly imperative, especially uh, during a pandemic when so many communities have been uh, ha have uh, faced such uh, discrimination. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Next up, we have Abraham Gross, followed by Lauren Springer and M.E. Green Cohen. Abraham? Time starts now. Uh, I'll start by thanking Chairs Carnegie and Landsman. Uh, after being denied some of the most basic human rights for more than a year, I plead with the chairs to use their discretion, not cut me up right off at two minutes. I promise to finish in a timely manner. I just want a little bit more, more time, and there's ample precedent. The chairs have discretion to give a member of the public a few more minutes. The past two hours, we've been talking about the suffering of the 60 or 80,000 
people who are in homeless shelters, where I've also been, unfortunately, and the threat of much many more people don't know what the number is of people who may find themselves in the homeless situation. And I want to ask the honorable council members a very simple question. Why aren't we using the current inventory of over 150,000 vacant affordable apartments that were already paid for with various tax abatements and which are kept empty for reasons only HPD knows? Why in light of a humanitarian crisis can't honorable members stand up to HPD and say, we see the city data, we see that these apartments are vacant, we have homeless people who are, who are facing the pandemic. I mean, do you really need me to, to bring this? To, I mean, this could happen today. You can solve a big part of all of homelessness in New York City today with apartments that are available. How do we know so much apartments are available? I beg you for the opportunity to show you exactly how much, how we know that. First of all, out of um, the new construction 421A apartments, thousands of them were purposely kept vacant. That's right. They never arrived at the- Time expired. Please, just a couple more minutes. They're, these apartments were never given to low income applicants to begin with. They, the developers took the tax abatement and then used every fraudulent way to keep these apartments at convert them back to market rate. And I, this is, I'm gonna be strategic here. Thank you. Two minutes is all I asked for. I came to a council member who's been on this call and ask questions on this call. And I explained my grievance and people in her office looked at my documentation and said, this is outrageous. Why is this guy rejected? These numbers are conclusory, they're cryptic, they contradict what the regulatory agreement says. This council member promised to help me. She was gonna write HPD a letter. She never followed up. We had a meeting, she never called me. I begged her for some kind of response. What happened? No response. I finally, as I was about to head into shelter for the first time in my life in September, I came to her office, asked her chief of staff, what happened? Why, why is a public official treating a constituent like dirt or less than dirt? Is that the standard? She said to me, there's nothing the council member could do. You have to go into a shelter. At the, and lo and behold, it turns out that at the exact same time that that council member hung me out to dry, she also moved into the uh, adjacent complex from the complex from which I was rejected into a luxury apartment that was not on the market. Now I am respectfully appealing to all of you honorable members of the council of the city of New York. There are 51 of you. There has to be a group of council members of integrity who won't allow this to happen. Don't let my words just oh, another guy is complaining, we're gonna ignore him. It is September 17, 2020, and those people and shelters are suffering so much unnecessarily. The apartments are there. And, and my final thing is another amazing way to free up apartments for the homeless shelter is if you force the HPD executives, their family and friends, the state judges and, and um, uh, federal judges and all those other privileged parties who were granted for free through documents that are on ACRIS, although sometimes using a person who's been dead for 30 years to cover it up. If you forced every single public official who's embezzled public property and treated it like it's their own property, if you force them to give those apartments back to the public, do you know how many apartments you could have? Thank you, thank you, Mr. Gross. Thank I really you. appreciate your comments. And um, that's what these hearings are for, actually, is to hear your voice and to make sure that we can make the necessary changes. So thank you for coming to the hearing to be able to voice your opinion. Thank you. Next up, we have Lauren Springer, followed by Emmy Green Cohen. Lauren. Time starts now. 
My name is Lauren Springer. I'm a tenant leader with Catholic Migration Services, a nonprofit legal services provider and community-based organization, actively engaged in tenant organizing work, and I'm also an active member of the right, New York City Right to Council Coalition. The COVID-19 public health crisis has exposed existing um, social, economic, health, and other inequities that need to be addressed. Now is not the time to return to business as usual or to maintain the status quo, but to take this opportunity to deconstruct these inequities and injustices and to create a society that takes care of everyone, in particular um, vulnerable communities. And there are several ways that the City Council can do this. We need to extend the eviction moratorium. Um, we need to, um, housing court can no longer be an eviction mill and it cannot be full speed ahead with um, eviction. So we need to slow down the pace of the court calendar. We need to fund tenant organizers so they can let people know about their rights and their right to counsel. Um, we need to reorder our priorities where, it take, where cases that protect the rights of tenants take priority. Um, over the um, landlord's right to sue and evict. Um, we need to make sure that the housing court is safe. With so many tenants facing the threat of eviction, once the moratorium lifts, the COVID-19 health crisis has only shown the need um, for right to counsel and housing court eviction proceedings. Pre-pandemic, this, this um, council was on track to pass intro 1104 and intro 1529. It had garnered more than two thirds support of the council membership. Um, and data shows that right to counsel legislation works. Therefore, I strongly urge the city council to pass intro 2015. And I also basically say that the city council must do everything in its power to restructure housing court, pass intro 2050, pressure the state legislator to take the necessary steps to protect tenants. All of New York City, or I should say all of New York State, but specifically New York City will be adversely impacted by a failure to take action once the eviction moratorium expires. Thank you. Thank you. We will now hear from Emmy Green Cohen. Time starts now. Hello, good morning. I don't know if you can hear me or not. Okay. I'm not so technologically advanced. But I you. did. Can you hear me? We can hear you, yes. Oh, good. Um, I submitted um, our testimony, my testimony today, under the auspices of the Harlem Housing Advocacy Group, Incorporated. We incorporated, I'm the founding executive director, and we incorporated in January 2017 to bring some, to bring power to our pain. We submitted testimony, Carlton Barrows and myself, regarding this, the nucleus of our troubles, which is 938 St. Nicholas Avenue, where we're asking for an investigation of HPD and its, its, its um, tentacles throughout this housing community that's supposedly affordable, when in fact, it really is an opportunity for um, city properties to be transferred to uh, predatory lenders through uh, Article 11 and their ability to have advanced payments um, to these to these to these projects, and it's really very people are suffering. We've been suffering for 15 years. They refuse to make an a settlement. They refuse to repair the disrepair that the sponsor developers gave to our building. Our organization is a, basically a group of the walking wounded. We've organized ourselves. We want housing justice. We want um, affordable, healthy housing. We are not supposed to be the vessels for which people can exploit low income and, and, and mid income uh, people so that they in turn can devolve it over so that it becomes a predator to the predatory lenders. And it's, 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 it is unconsciously unfair, it's unconstitutional, and something must be done. We're I'm expired. organized to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you. We're gonna hold for this one moment to ensure we have no final witnesses. Just one moment. This concludes our public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could please use their raise hand function on Zoom, we'll call on you now.
All right, seeing none, we'll now hand it off to Chair Cornegy to close the hearing. Uh, thank you so much. I wanna thank you for all the testimony today. Um, I do want to say that I feel the pain and the passion in the in our in the folks that have testified. Um, we've had our concerns with HPD and continue to work to make sure that HPD functions as a catalyst for providing affordable housing units for, for folks in our community. Um, those people who've had concerns as directly related to HPD, please feel free to reach out to, to my office as the chair. Um, of housing and buildings, I think it's important. Um, somebody mentioned third party transfer. We are not done with this third party transfer process. We have a suite of bills looking to um, uh, plug the holes that we found, especially in the third party transfer program um, that only stopped because of COVID and we are up now running again and ready to address the third party transfer needs in our communities around HPD and HPD overall. Um, this has been an ongoing problem. The situations transcend even a current commissioner who's in place, but we are meeting continually to see if we can make sure that HPD functions the way it was intended to function and does what it was intended to do. Um, I want to again thank the committee staff. I want to thank everybody who's worked on this particular hearing. Um, and really, this is not falling on deaf ears. We have these hearings because we this hearing in particular we held because we understand that once the um, moratorium is lifted, that there will be a literal parade or onslaught. And we wanna see to the degree that we can mitigate some of that by bringing HPD and by bringing the other agencies forward. Um, this, it, we've never seen anything like this before. And we understand that prior to this, we were already in a backlog uh, with, with, with um, evictions and foreclosures. So that is an absolute priority for this administration. It's a priority for this council. It's a priority for this committee to make sure that we can reduce the number of people who are negatively impacted in their housing situation due to COVID. We saw COVID exacerbate every inequity possible in the city of New York, especially housing inequities and uh, healthcare inequities. So we are reeling and trying to make sure that we can protect New York City citizens in their quest to have good affordable housing, good affordable health care, education, and all of those things. So that's what this hearing was about. We will continue until we get to the justice that we need to serve the communities that we serve. Again, thank you for attending the hearing. Um, this hearing is now closed. Oh, I'm sorry. There may be comments from my co-chair, the Honorable Rory Lansman. I'm sorry, Rory. No problem, Robert. Thank you very much. And thank you for taking the lead on this hearing. Um, it's an extremely important subject. And uh, I thought it was very helpful to hear from OCA and from the legal services providers, as well as from members of the public. Um, there is a storm that's brewing. And once these uh, eviction proceedings are going forward, uh, full steam ahead, uh, we're going to see a lot of people in the city of New York hurting really badly at risk of losing their homes. Um, which is a terrible circumstance under uh, at any time, but in the middle of a pandemic, uh, particularly tragic. I was encouraged um, by um, what I heard today, but obviously there are still things that, that need to be worked on, particularly uh, when it comes to the operation of the process that the city has set up to make sure that everybody who needs re legal representation uh, gets it. So uh, thank you so much to the staff, uh, to the committee staff at uh, Committee on the Justice System, uh, to Max, my own counsel, uh, um, uh, Michael Klinger, uh, and to everyone who uh, helped make this hearing run as smoothly as it did. Uh, thank you very much. So, so as lastly, what I can say is you can always judge a commitment and our priority by the way it reflects in the budget. And we did, in a $9 billion budget, protect the lines that were developed and created to make sure that there was advocacy and attorneys. Um, so where everybody else took tremendous cuts, we fought diligently to make sure that those cuts were not reflected in the way that we deal with um, eviction and in foreclosure. So I can attest to the fact that this particular administration saw the need to make sure that those programs that undergird um, 
uh, eviction prevention and foreclosure prevention were, were remained whole and we'll continue to fight for more resources because we know as we go forward and these numbers increase of those in jeopardy of being homeless uh, that we have these services in place. Thank you. Uh, this hearing is now closed.